went through Now security they did not see him They just hovered around his tomb But there's a pretty little Good evening and welcome to the April 23rd, 2018 work session of the Mayor and City Council. Tonight we are going to take a deep dive into the budget and um, leading us in this will be Tony Tomasello. Tony, we, the first item we have on our on this agenda is introductions. I didn't know if you wanted to go around. How do you want to handle that? Um, I, I think people can introduce themselves when they come when up. When they come up, okay. Well then, um, because of the nature, the in-depth nature of this um, endeavor, um, traditionally we take comments from the public first at this work session and, uh, and then dive into the budget. Um, I don't see any members of the public, but I will make the call anyway if you know, perhaps somebody wants to say something that they wouldn't otherwise say. Um, does anybody, would anyone like to make any comments before we begin? It was a beautiful day today. Well done. Okay. Uh, that said, then I will just hand it over to Tony and let him take it away. Thank you, Mayor. Just a few minutes of, of introduction. Um, of course, you see a number of people he here tonight. Some of them are presenters and some of them are uh, staff that are here to support answering any questions. Um, hopefully we can get to all of your questions tonight. Some of them we might have to get back to you depending on how, how far you, you drill down, as you say. Um, we'll be using generally the same format that we've used in other years on the operating budget, uh, which is uh, has a different look this year, but it is still effectively the same. You'll get a department introduction, a percentage increase in the overall department or decrease. Uh, that'll be followed by the individual objects, um, and they will lead off each of those with a, a percent change up or down as well and then we'll focus on the significant changes in each of the the objects within the budget um, for those watching on television there is a little bit of a difference between the packet and the published budget book uh, we will be using the packet pages so you will not be affected but if if someone had just pulled up the draft budget online right now um, the pages are off by three so if you're looking at, we're looking at page, um, see, we'll start on page 63, they, they'll be looking at, uh, if we're looking at page 66, they'll be looking at page 63. Um, that is the nature of a cella. So it's very precise and we added a three page agenda before the, the packet. Uh, so Thank you for that clarification. Um, after that, <clears throat> as we discussed at the retreat, the CIP does have quite a different look this year and Dennis will be going through the highlights of the CIP after the operating budget. Um, so unless there's questions about uh, process, we'll just go ahead and, and get started. No, we're grateful to have everybody here tonight and look forward to it. Go right ahead. So we, we start with the um, CMO, which consists of seven divisions. Um, the uh, city manager's office uh, aggregate budget is up 5.2% uh, overall. Um, the first three divisions are actually covered by city attorney board. Good evening. Um, I will cover the first three activities. The first is 1101, which is Mayor and Council Services. It starts on page 68 of the agenda packet. Um, there is an increase of 16.3%, which is primarily due to the salary and benefit increase for the Mayor and Council. That'll go into effect July 1st. Um, other than that, there are no significant changes in this account. 
questions? <coughs> no, go right ahead. All right. We'll then stop. Okay. Our rule is if we have a question, just shout it out. Okay. Otherwise, okay. you guys keep going. Okay. Uh, the next account is 1111, which is legal services, begins on page 73. Um, there is an increase of 19.3% in this account, and that is due to the addition of um, one position, which would be a paralegal two position, which is designed to facilitate um, the contracting portion of the city's procurement process. Um, other than that, there are no significant changes to that account. Uh, the last one for me this evening is 1122, Registration and Elections, uh, begins at page 78. There is a 96.2% decrease in this account because obviously we do not have an election in physical year 19. So there are significant changes in printing and binding, postage and rental and usage. Uh, we do retain a small amount of money, about $2,000, or not about, exactly $2,000 uh, in that budget so we can um, promote the election and voter registration in the off election years. Great. So, and that's it for me, unless there are questions. Thank you, Lynn. Okay. Okay. Uh, the Boy, office. We're off to a great start. <laughs> <laughs> we are. <laughs> office of the city manager, uh, eleven thirty-one is up seventeen and a half percent. What uh, page is that? That is packet page eighty. Okay. <clears throat> there are two significant changes. Uh, the first being IT consultant services uh, increased by twenty-four thousand three hundred ninety dollars. That is actually an initiative that we're we are working on. Uh, uh, we're kind of testing out an open data platform and we're working with a company called My Sidewalk. We are working with them currently in this year uh, to develop some model uh, dashboards that we could link our um, web page to that would illustrate uh, progress made on certain strategic directions and certain data uh, about the city. Um, we are, uh, we will make a decision about signing back up kind of go live with my sidewalk next year um, and that will be the funding required to, to do that we have actually not made that decision yet um, as we kind of work through the process and see if that is actually the right vendor for us <clears throat> the other is a is a transfer um, where we have uh, the neighborhood grant program which has traditionally been in uh, neighborhood services has been transferred to CMO uh, sixty thousand dollar increase uh, because it's actually managed by Monica Marquita, the Legislative Affairs Manager. And that's all for CMO. Next is economic development. Take it easy. You can come up there. <laughs> Tom's not here. Kim, Kim just did the exact thing she was afraid she was going to do <laughs> this morning when she was describing her fear about this presentation. It's not a big deal. Tom's not here. <laughs> what page are you on, Tom? Uh, economic development, uh, uh, which would start at packet yep. page 86. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom apologizes. He's, he is not here this evening, but I can certainly cover for him. Um, the, develop, the economic development budget is back down 11.9%. Uh, that is a decrease, all attributable to a, a decrease in the economic development activities budget, which is a toolbox. Uh, the toolbox funding is sufficient to carry it for several years, probably, so we decided to decrease that uh, this year. Any questions on that? On packet page 90, we have environmental services. That, that budget is up 5.4%. And there are no significant changes within that budget. The budget going up five percent is due to just uh, mostly attributable increases. to wages. The overall wage increase was okay. three point seven percent, and then there's some smaller increases in there, but none of them rose to the level of five thousand okay. dollars. And then the seventh category is housing and community development. That is also down 11%. That's packet page 94. We are uh, decreasing uh, IT services because we bought a software package for grants management last year. We won't need to buy that again this year, just some uh, ma maintenance. Miscellaneous professional services went up almost the same amount, $5,000 uh, to increase for because HUD's reporting requirements have gone up and the prices, frankly, of the consultant who writes them have gone up. Um, and then the, which we just described, contributions, 
Um, this is neighborhood. This is where neighborhood matching funding was, and that's been transferred into 1131. So there was a decrease here of fifty-four thousand dollars, and actually an increase in CMO, I believe, sixty thousand dollars. So we will be expanding that program a little bit. Uh, Tony, when you were talking about the second item, the miscellaneous professional services for reporting to HUD, that doesn't include the other program that we started with reporting on uh, FHA uh, or FHFA. So FHA recertification, recertification. Does it? that's a separate I do not believe so but we have a lease that can yes. definitively <laughs> um, that particular FHA consulting is under the special housing fund this is this additional these are admin costs for the CWT program that are reimbursed by HUD got it thank you Any other questions about CMO? Then we can move to human resources. All right. I think that's Kim. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. The human resources budget information starts on page 98. Human resources is activity 1135, and the overall increase for FY 2019 is 11.1 percent, and there are four significant changes. The first significant change is in the out-of-pocket deductible reimbursement account, object code 514700. FY19 will be the third year in the row that employees and their dependents may complete a preventative <coughs> care exam in order to be in re reimbursed for their medical plan deductible. Now that employees are more comfortable with this approach, we are seeing an increase in the amount of reimbursement requests being submitted by employees, resulting in the need to increase the fund to more accurately reflect the employee usage. Funding for the deductible reimbursements for all benefit eligible city employees is in the HR account. Second significant change is in information technology, uh, object code 531000, which increased $24,988, in part as a result of increased processing fees charged by our HR information and payroll system provider. This account also ref reflects the increase in maintenance costs following the addition of the performance evaluation platform to our existing HR management software that automates recruitment, hiring, onboarding, and offboarding. The city realizes significant savings and, and streamlines the, the entire process by utilizing the same software provider for the HR management functions. The, sir, the third significant change is in advertising object code 541000. With the retirement of 14 full-time employees, by the end of the fiscal year, we have budgeted some additional funding for advertising in FY 2019 to fill these vacancies. While most advertising of job opportunities is done through the city website, we occasionally advertise positions on job-specific web pages that charge a fee. Recruiting qualified applicants to fill our job vacancies is one of our top pri priorities, and we continue to explore options to meet this challenge. We have requested increased funding earmarked to promote targeted positions on Indeed, the most visited online job site, allowing these jobs to be the first that people see on Indeed after the internet search. This will help us reach more talent and bring more visitors to the city job board. On average, more than 60% of our applicants indicate that they learned about a city of Gaithersburg job opportunity through Indeed. Yeah. The last significant changes in awards and presentations, object code 542000, which increased $10,500. Funds in this account are used to recognize and appreciate the excellent work of all city employees throughout the year. The additional funding is, is requested due to a slight increase in the number of employees who will be recognized for reaching milestone years of service during FY 2019, but the increase is primarily because we have experienced an increase in employee participa participation in our annual appreciation events, which include the picnic and the, the recognition luncheon. And that's all I have. Thank I just you. want to compliment everybody on the uh, pie chart on page 100 that shows 100% of human resources funding going to human resources. <laughs> <laughs> Best pie chart in the uh, top. I want to say uh, having an increase in the number of people reaching milestone years of service is a good thing. It speaks well of, of how we treat our employees yeah, absolutely. and how absolutely. loyal they are to the city as well. So I want to recognize uh, those individuals who have achieved that, those milestones. Yeah. I, uh, I had a question. Um, I was at a meeting last week with one of the representatives of Legit um, who made a passing comment to me about, and this may be unofficial or um, I hope it's not something that I'm not supposed to make public yet, but he, he said that you can expect a, a good reimbursement this coming year as well. 
Um, so I don't know if you all know anything about that yet. You see Tony snap to attention there. <laughs> but uh, that's what he said to me. I don't know if it was accurate. How they, but would, how they would know that this far in advance, I'm not really sure, but... Okay. We're flexible on that point. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. If they want to give us money, we'll take it. Yeah. Okay, I wasn't sure if staff had heard anything to that effect yet. We, we, we have not. Okay. Yeah. Kim, thank you. I just wanted to make a note to our to the Boy Scouts and to the family that just walked in. Um, you guys walked in to, I'm assuming, to observe for, as Boy Scouts often do, to uh, observe government in action. And tonight we're, we're taking a real deep dive into our budget, which is to say that there are basically any other meeting you see will be more exciting than this one. <laughs> but this is very important to what we do. So thank you guys for coming. Picked a doozy of a meeting. <laughs> okay. Good evening. We're now moving on to the Department of Community and Public Relations. I believe that starts on page 109 of your packet. Um, the Department of Community and Public Relations is comprised of public information, cable television, community services, and homeless services, those four divisions. And overall, the department is proposing an increase of just 1.5%. Um, the first division, Public Information Office, 1212, starts on page 113. As Kim mentioned, um, there are impacts from the retirement incentive that was given, and we are going to be seeing the retirement of two very long-term and very valuable staff members in PIO, one specializing in graphic design, um, the other one in graphic design and print production. And this is allowing us the opportunity to reorganize the department. Uh, we will be hiring a full-time graphic designer, but we're also looking at filling the second full-time position with an administrative staff member who's going to specialize in marketing support, something that's much needed in the division. Uh, prior to the announcement of those retirements, we were also approved for an additional half-time position to start in December of 2018. So what we're looking at right now is advertising for the two full-time positions, waiting to see how they flush out before determining what that half-time position is going to be. Originally, the half-time position was going to be for the administrative support, but we can now take advantage of a full-time for that. So um, speaking of your headcount, <laughs> and I've probably said this for the last several years, uh, I'd like to see this department with more people. I, um, I don't know if Tony's on board with that, um, but I think that, that getting the word out is something that you've heard from me more than once, uh, that I'd like to see stronger and uh, communication than what you have the ability to do with the staff that you have today. And I know we're scheduled to have a get together mm -hmm. to talk about strategy at some point. So this year, may, it may be too late for that, but I hope you're still thinking. And as we talk strategy, we focus on how to actually achieve what we want to achieve for the city. Thank you. Um, you'll see in some minor parts of the 12-12 um, the budget, there are some minor um, increases for supplies and equipment that would accommodate that new position, workstations and things like that. For um, IT non-consultant services line item, that's decreased by about $11,700. That's primarily due to the reduction in the website content management system expenses after the initial contract that was spent in this year. Uh, the design for the website has been approved. We're finalizing the wireframe and the content migration should start soon and we anticipate launching it in late summer. Um, the new economic development website <coughs> operates on the same platform and they will launch concurrently. And I also wanted to note that we're nearing the final determination of a vendor for our digital asset management system, which is funded in this current fiscal year. There are some funds in FY19 for temporary staff to help us migrate and organize the thousands of photos that we're going to be putting into that new system. Hopefully we can work smarter. Can I ask um, what systems you're looking at? Or I would rather not say at this point as we're still talking with them. Okay. Um, the miscellaneous professional services line item decreased by $17,300. There will be no biennial citizen survey this year, in this fiscal year. Um, we did increase the allocation in this line item a little bit for freelance photography. Again, the need for compelling images just continues to grow as we expand our outreach. Um, as Lynn mentioned, with the, without having elections this year, there are decreases in several places. We have advertising decreased by $5,000 and postage decreased by $7,000 because those are election-related expenses. And then while it doesn't rise to the level of a significant change, I did want to note that there is funding in the miscellaneous line item to support the development of a citizen ambassador program to help with outreach, something we talked about during the retreat. Um, and then we've also put a little bit of money in there for some preliminary communications ahead of Census 2020. Are there any questions in the PIO budget? 
if, if I can make a comment on, on Neil's comment, we, Britt and I have discussed that and we are open to mid-year. Um, once she gets through realigning the uh, department, I think she's looking to do some kind of higher impact things with the new people. Mm -hmm. uh, but if that is not sufficient, then we will, we will look at a mid-year ad. Great, thank you. Okay, for the cable television, it starts on page 118. There's only one significant change in the television budget. We are entering into a contract with a vendor to assist us with the policy development and training for the drone program. Um, the $6,000 test preparation and training costs for two pilots, which we plan to do over the summer, is budgeted in uh, conferences and class registration in FY19. As we get closer to actually deploying the drone, um, we will conduct a very public campaign to ensure that our residents are aware of what we will be doing and probably more importantly, what we will not be doing with that drone. <laughs> are there any questions about the cable TV budget? <coughs> okay, on to community services, it's 1215. That's on page 122. Program activities increased by $11,300. Our teachers asked for additional support for ethics education initiatives, so we're actually planning character counts assemblies in 14 elementary schools this year. Um, to enhance our financial wellness program, we've budgeted $3,000 to help bring a nationally known speaker to a symposium in Gaithersburg. The balance of that person's fee would be offset by our bank on Gaithersburg partners. There's a decrease in the furniture and fixtures expenditures by about $6,000. We have modular furniture budgeted for and purchase, will be purchased in the next couple of months. And then our IT non-consultant services decreased by just over $9,000. In FY18, we implemented uh, a new automated grant portal, and the expenses are going to be significantly less in subsequent years. Uh, we're actually still in the midst of grant <coughs> application reviews at this point, and our recommendations from the Community Advisory Committee and Educational Enrichment Committee will come before you in June. We do want to thank you for approving this expense in FY18. It is proving to be very helpful in streamlining the application process for our nonprofits and schools and also for the reviewers. It's all now uh, quite automated. Then the contributions budget increased by a total of 20150 This additional funding is primarily um, going to be used to support youth initiatives. So we looking, we're looking to increase funding for the Boer Parent Resource Center at Gaithersburg Elementary School. Mm -hmm. Then in FY19, we're allowing nonprofit school-based grants to be available for programs that operate in elementary and middle schools. Previously, they were only available to our high schools. We're also slightly expanding the scopes of services in the Housing Preservation and Transportation Grant and also the Financial Fitness Grant. Thank you. Hearing no questions, I'll move along. Homeless Services is the last one. It's on page 128. With the loss of HUD funding prior to the FY18 budget, we were asked to explore operational budget cuts. Within the professional uh, miscellaneous professional line item in FY18, we decreased by about a third the amount that we set aside for a contract to guarantee placements for inpatient treatment from our street outreach efforts. Successful completion of inpatient treatment is a requisite for eventual placement at Wells and for many other programs for those in recovery. Unfortunately, with the reduction in that contract, we were unable to actually secure a contract for that amount, so we're operating without one. Uh, we will not be spending the money in the current fiscal year, and we've eliminated it completely from the FY19 proposed budget. That's a uh, reduction of about $14,000. Um, I think because of longstanding relationships with inpatient treatment providers and because of health care insurance options, um, Jimmy and his street outreach team have been able to secure placements for most of those in need without having that contract in place. And this reduction has not really impacted the occupancy at Wells. We did add funds within the miscellaneous professional services budget to cover regular bed bug monitoring. Fun topic. We are using the <laughs> services of a canine who's appropriately named Sherlock. And every couple of months he comes in to detect the presence of bed bugs before we have an infestation. Um, we have other protocols that have been put in place to help keep bed bugs from getting in as well. That's cool. A bed bug <laughs> detecting dog. Yes. Mm -hmm. Named Sherlock. And while we are no longer receiving federal funding for the Wells program, our staff continues to look for grant opportunities. We've expanded a contractual arrangement that we have with Montgomery County to provide case, manage case management for residents living in permanent supportive housing in Gaithersburg. That's increasing that contract from about 19,500 to it can go up to as much as 30,000 depending on the number of clients we take on. And additionally, we're increasing our occupancy revenue by about 4,000 this year. Their clients that are being admitted to Wells and those transitioning over to DeSellum are increasingly able to work. 
and those um, efforts in the air, our efforts in the area of vocational training are paying good dividends and helping them get employed. So we're seeing an increase in their ability to pay the occupancy fees. And then as we discussed at the retreat back in February, an annual report of homeless service activities and outcome measures is gonna be prepared at the end of this current fiscal year. And then very soon, we're also gonna be launching a bi-monthly homeless services newsletter. So we'll have a new e-newsletter that we can use to help tell the story of the important work that's being done by the city in the area of homeless assistance. I hear no questions. All right. Thank you very much, Britta. You're welcome. Good evening. I'm Stephanie Walker. I am representing the finance um, department, and that begins on page 134 of the agenda packet. Um, this, this department is made up of three activities, the finance administration, general services, and non-departmental, and in total increased 4.5%. The finance and administration activity represents ex uh, expenditures related to the operation of the finance department and the budget line items for this can be found beginning on page 138. <coughs> this activity increased 3.6%, and the only significant change was related to the software maintenance account, which increased due to the purchase of uh, new budget software. I would like to, at this point, um, pass along a huge, huge thank you to um, JJ, our budget analyst, who is here tonight, for all the work that he did during our, our implementation and, and project management, along with uh, a even bigger thank you to all of the, the budget staff uh, throughout the city in all of the different departments who gave up their time, not just during the regular budget process, which is time consuming enough, uh, but during the off season in order to help us design the system, uh, go to training and, and provide feedback. And um, I, I know it's probably um, a bigger lift than they necessarily wanted to, but I, I really appreciate it. Um, and we would not be where we are with it without all of their help. and. Um, the little complaining, at least within my earshot. So uh, I appreciate all of it. Thank you. The uh, <coughs> second activity is the general services, and that begins on page 143. This activity decreased uh, by point, point 0.1% uh, percent or $78 and had no significant changes. The last activity within the department is actually the non-departmental uh, activity, and that begins on page 145. This had an overall increase of 4.5% relating specifically to five significant changes. The first is our miscellaneous professional services account. And this account is primarily made up of the city's contract for speed camera services. And the budget for this decreased uh, because that, that contract is a fixed fee uh, decreasing contract. Uh, it expires in FY21, so we can look forward to uh, decreasing expenditures in, in that line over the next two years. The next account, tax abatement account, increased by approximately 45000 due to a new abatement agreement that came on, online this past year. The transfers to our capital project fund in, uh, decreased by $391,200. This transfer amount fluctuates annually depending on our funding needs for our capital projects, where we are as far as pre-funding them, uh, as well as where we are for our, our spending. The transfer to our asset replacement fund increased by $180,785. We began budgeting for the asset replacement fund in, 2000, in FY17. Um, the amount of this transfer is really based on an updating an asset inventory list of over 3,000 different assets um, from a number of different departments. And the increase in this transfer is due to changes in how we're estimating some of the replacement costs, as well as an additional 125,000 in funding for city vehicles as part of a catch-up provision due to some underfunding in, in prior years. The last significant change relates to our transfer to our other post-employment benefit trust, and that increased by 700,000 as part of a multi-year plan to bring the city closer to our fully funding our actuarial cost for this actual this obligation. If I can say that. I mean, health insurance. I mean, Re retiree health. Retiree. Yeah, well, retiree. Retiree. it's not. No, 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 I know. I know. OPEB is, is retiree health and health insurance, but. It's just consistently, it's an item that always, it's go, it goes up from year to year. What for current employees and for retired employees, it's going up. That's what's happening. It's happening you, everywhere, all yeah. over the place. Yeah. There's there's all kinds theoretically, of with OPEB, if you, if you get enough in the trust, mm -hmm. it, it's supposed to just throw off enough earnings to pay your expenses. That's going to take a long time to do. 
We have yet to hit that theoretical yeah. <laughs> threshold. Well, we're doing better than most municipalities in this respect. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Most I'm not saying we're doing badly. I'm just saying health insurance is just a huge challenge for everybody. And we haven't borrowed from it either. That's the <laughs> Were you going to say something? Uh, just, uh, I may have missed this. You may have said it. But um, in the non-departmental, the second item was the uh, $31,000 increase because yeah, the county has started um, charging us a lot more for yeah. providing tax billing services. <laughs> yes, you're right. Good point. And I just, you know, I wanted to make sure we mentioned that for the benefit of the public that they know that the county, which they pay taxes to, is um, basically charging the city, which they pay taxes to, uh, An a, lot artificial more, a, charge. Lot, a lot more money, <coughs> basically, to take care of the piece of paper that they get once a year. That they were going to print out anyway. That the county was going to print out anyway. Uh, to tell them what their property tax bill is. Well, so this is the second year in a row with a pretty significant, with a significant increase, increase in yes. this line item. Yeah. Are we going to see that again? Uh, so my question was going about this is going to be: Is there an expectation for yet another large increase in it the is. next year? Um, we we've been told that next year they plan to increase it uh, probably another fifteen percent or so. Uh, <laughs> un unfortunately, they indicated that they did cost study of of what it costs to. Um, to build the ta do prepare the tax bills and send it out. Now my assumption is that uh, it doesn't cost them that much more to add one extra or excuse me two extra lines on it for us. Um, but I, I mean I, I do understand there are some costs to, to the program. Um, it's still um, more cost effective to have them do it at this high of a fee than it would be for us to do it in house. Um, having worked for jurisdictions that do local tax collection at the municipal level, um, it's it's a very time intensive process, uh, and you end up having um, numerous staff on hand because you have to be available to take payments on a very regular basis, especially with multiple payments. Um, so it's we're we're sort of stuck because it is not something that you really would want to bring in house because um, the last thing we want to do is send residents two tax bills, right, one from the county and one from the city. Um, that would probably not go over well. But yes, they, they did increase their costs uh, about 30000 from this year to last. Uh, I believe in 2017, we were paying roughly 30000 total, and it's now up to 128000 So uh, it's a fairly significant over a two-year increase. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for, for pointing that out, Councilman. So with respect to OPEB cost year over year, um, what are we looking forward to to reach full funding as um, we move forward? <laughs> well, it's, it's a mixed bag. So we are required under accounting standards to do an actuarial evaluation every two years. And so this was the second year of it. So uh, this upcoming and probably the next three to six months, we'll be getting a new valuation. And so they'll look at the new medical trends and they'll new look at the new um, future investment trends and they'll recalculate the liability and they'll give us a different number to target for. So it, it's a little bit of a moving target because if interest rates go up by half a percent, your liability can change by several million and your annual cost can change by several hundred thousand. Now we are, um, have proposed to change the benefits for new employees moving forward and that should help reduce our costs in future years bring it down. With our last actuarial evaluation, the annual uh, OPEB expense was $4.3 million. So we're funding two point nine million to the trust. So there is a gap there. But if you look at it at a pay-as-you-go uh, standpoint, meaning only paying the amount out that the trust is expected to pay out in a given year, that's closer to about 600000 And so we are still adding assets to the trust um, above and beyond what is expected to be paid out on an annual basis which is good. Um, we want to make sure that we don't hit a spike where it's, it's, uh, we have a, you know, a large wave where suddenly that, that flips and you know, we're paying out four and a half million and we're only contributing uh, six million or 600,000. That's so, why we're increasing our budget for plaques and awards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I mean, I think we're, we're in a good place with it. We're moving you know, the contribution you know, up incrementally each year. Um, and then we're also reviewing the, the benefit levels for future employees and you know, doing a new valuation um, every other year to see where, where the trends fall or on a long-term basis. The current actuarial target, <coughs> which is already dated since we're going to have another one, was 
50, 55? Oh, was, a million? Yeah. Um, was it, I, think I think it was 51 million. 51 oh. million, and we have 15, something like that, which is 15 more than most towns have at this point, but mm -hmm. we're, 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 if we're, we're spending six or seven hundred thousand dollars a year and putting in 2.9, you know, we're catching up. So eventually, hopefully we'll catch up. And when you combine that with the reduction in benefits for new employees, specifically spouses of new employees. So why would we need $50 million in the, in the bank for this fund? Accounting the, standards. The fund is uh, supposed to throw off enough earnings to pay the benefit. When most towns just use pay as you go sure. to pay the benefit, um, oh. but much like the GASB requirements that you maintain infrastructure, now you have to have a dedicated trust to pay for post-employment benefits. But paying it only out of earnings seems pretty extreme. Yeah. So, I mean, and our and our benefit is fairly limited compared to counties and states. Yeah. So yeah. The, the liability really represents, um, if you think of it as you know, someone has a 20-year service life in employment, right, until they retire, um, and you're in year 10, the the liability really represents the first 10 years that that you were employed by the city and how much you should have set aside in each one of those years in order to the day that they retire, you have a fund fully available to them to draw down and pay for their health care for the future. So it's not really a timing on when the payment's going to be used, it's a timing of how the employee earns it um, and a reflection of the fact that you know our employees are all at different service lives and, and places in, in that cycle. So uh, from that standpoint, it's a, it's a liability because it's attributable to past service life of, of the employees. Um, <laughs> the yep. funness of accounting, right? Yep. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Welcome, Pete. Good evening. Yeah. Peter Cottrell, representing the Information Technology Department. <coughs> Excuse me. The Information Technology Budget begins on page 150. And the IT department consists of two activities. 1145 is uh, Information Technology, and 1146 is Geographic Information Systems more commonly known as GIS. As an aggregate, the IT budget is up 2.2% for FY19. Uh, IT 1145 budget is up 3%, and the uh, budget for 1146 GIS is down 2.5% for FY19. The proposed FY19 budget for information technology reflects the sustainment of an expanding and increasingly technical infrastructure with incremental increases for software services and for software and hardware maintenance. There are three significant changes for 1145 information technology in the proposed budget. 531,000 information technology services increased by $6,378, largely due to annual costs associated with the move to a hosted service for the city's intranet website and for costs for a proposed mobile device management solution. 531600 software maintenance agreements increased by $8,715 due to incremental annual increases for various software packages as well as for increased costs for new security software and for increased data backup capacity. 573000 repair and maintenance for machinery and equipment increased by $27,500 due to the need purchase ongoing hardware maintenance for the city's core network storage systems, whose initial three-year maintenance agreements will expire in early FY19. All right, can I ask a couple questions? Sure. We knew that was coming, right? Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, if I'm reading this right, on your consulting services where you increased by $6,700 and including a mobile device management <coughs> solution, is that what is saving us 15,000 at the Parks and Rec Department? because they don't need a, a mobile technology of their own? Um, no, that is not. The okay. two are unrelated. The Parks and Rec is, uh, had a dedicated um, mobile application for their uh, special events, and they made the determination to, to not pay for that. Okay. The mobile device management solution is a piece of software that will help us uh, manage mobile devices in terms of putting uh, software releases onto them and maintaining the consistency of the devices. Okay, thank you. 
uh, more uh, a deeper question on the uh, the need for uh, core disk storage units. Can you describe what that is all about? Is that something that you you doing storage in the cloud, or is this your backup system? This is our, our core storage system for the city. Uh, this houses our, all of our user files. It's also um, the central server that um, provides all the disk space for our virtualized server environment. Mm -hmm. uh, there's two units. There's one here, and there's a replicated unit over at the Public Works facility. And uh, the virtual server environment we have runs off those um, and is able to, um, you know, if one unit goes down, automatically switch over to maintain the continuity of so services. So is there any thought of taking this out to the cloud at some point? There is not at the current time. Um, going to the cloud will certainly increase, uh, you know, the network traffic we have. Um, it'll probably end up costing more, we believe. Really? Because, I mean, cloud costs are coming down, have come down very dramatically over time. Well, I think it, it depends on how you look at it. I mean, it, it, there's storage costs, but there can also be transactional, transactional costs associated with them. It's fine. I'll trust that you've done the homework on that. I was just a little surprised to see that we were still doing it on premise. All right, thanks. And, and I, you know, as I mentioned, uh, this system's been in place for three years, so. Mm -hmm. Um, in the past, in the future, we might look at something, but uh, at this point, we have a, a on-premise solution. Yep. So are are the IT systems protected from these uh, what seems to be random and increasing ransomware attacks uh, and hacks of uh, various institutional systems? Uh, we believe they are. Um, we certainly put a lot of attention into maintaining the security of the systems. Uh, one of the uh, items I mentioned in their software maintenance agreements was increased costs for new security software. Uh, those are a couple of software modules that live on our firewall for um, uh, advanced malware protection and advanced threat protection. So we have software that's looking out for that sort of thing and intercepting a lot of that traffic. So the uh <clears throat> the replicated or the, the uh, duplicated image that we have on two different storage sites, um, they're separated enough so that one, if one gets, if one of those sites gets hacked, then the other one is going to be free from that, protected from that hack being uh, infected. So. Yeah. Okay. I mean, each case that happens, you'd have mm -hmm. to look at it in visual to figure out what the threat vector is and, and what attack um, you're facing. Yeah. But yeah, the, the replication is certainly there as a, a mitigation um, towards any sort of um, malware. Okay. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. <laughs> <laughs> well, not. as I say, we put a lot yeah. of time and, and effort into uh, maintaining the security of the systems and uh, hope we're not tested too much. Yeah. Let's help. Okay. Go ahead, Pete. Thanks. Okay. Uh, the primary focuses of the GIS division includes the support and data development for the Water Quality Protection Program, including ongoing improvements to the parcel boundary and impervious cover data sets, and in providing information to the public via maps and a growing number of web-based applications and services. There is one significant change listed for the 1146 GIS activity. 531500 software licenses decreased by $20,900 after a one time purchase of additional GIS software licenses in FY18. That's all I had all for right. significant changes. Any other questions? Thank you, Pete. Thank you. And welcome, Michelle. Good evening. I'm Michelle Potter, the Director of Parks, Recreation, and Culture. The department budget begins on page 166 and encompasses 20 accounts, 1411 through 1438. Our budget looks a little different than the others as staff completes program budgets for each program and event, then they roll up into the department budget. Overall, the department is proposed to increase by 2.9% in FY19. Parks, Recreation, and Administration 
begins on page 175 and is up 16.8%. The department successfully transitioned to ActiveNet, our new recreation management software system in January. The project team will be evaluating and implementing additional features and capabilities in the near future. There are four significant changes. Accounting and audit increased $20,000 to reflect anticipated credit card processing and transaction fees. 51% or an average of 11,000 of our registrations occur online annually. Software maintenance agreements decrease $7,135 due to the migration of our new recreation management system. ADA decreased $5,000 to reflect trends in actual expenditures. Vehicle and equipment increased $25,000 for the purchase of a new truck to transport facility and program equipment. Recreation programs and sports begins on page 182 and is down 1.4%. General operating supplies decreased $12,270 to reflect the reduction in the cost of sports apparel. Staff conducted an internal inventory of equipment and supplementary purchases are not necessary in some areas. Our top three sports for participation include basketball, volleyball, youth, and teen, sport, teen soccer, and volleyball. And we're also experiencing an increased interest in tennis lessons, just so you know. Mm -hmm. Recreation classes starts on page 204 and is down 2.5%. Program activities decrease $7,000 because the dance recital is held every other year. Participant costumes will not need to be budgeted in FY19. This year's recital will be held on June 2nd at the auditorium at Gaithersburg High School at 7 p.m. Noteworthy is that we have over 4,000 people enrolled in our recreation classes, of which 73% are city residents. Youth services budget begins on page 208 and is up 5.4%. There are no significant changes in this activity. Programs include the city participation in Montgomery County Soccer for Change program that provides a safe and productive out-of-school time activity for vulnerable youth while reinforcing the values of accountability, respect, teamwork, and trust. It also supports our after-school programs that serve students from five elementary schools October through May and trips on non-instructional days throughout the school year. Summer camps budget begins on page 214 and is up 7.2%. Can I, uh, Michelle, can I just sure. uh, interrupt you and go back to the uh, youth services? Sure. I'm just looking at, <clears throat> on the line items, what's the sort of more significant expenditures to account for the 5.4% increase? It looks like most of it is wages. Um, I see a line item for program activities for $4,000. Right, it's our part-time salaries increased um, close to $16,000 due to the minimum wage impact. That's what I was um, mm -hmm. and let, suspecting, and I correct. Really just wanted to ask you about that. Correct, yeah. and um, at the very end, I'll let you know um, what our total department um, minimum wage impact was. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. So summer camps, um, this is also another one. Um, it's up 7.2%. And our minimum wage impact is close to $37,000, um, so you'll know that. Rental and use decreased $5,000 to reflect expenditure trends for the use of Montgomery County Public School buses to transport city camp participants. <coughs> and this year we have a seven-week program compared to a prior six-week camp session um, based on the new MCPS calendar. So we did modify our programs. The youth center at Robertson Park budget is located on page 219 and is up 7.2% also. There are no significant changes in this activity and participants from the center include students from Ridgeview and Lakelands Middle Schools and this facility had nearly 11,000 membership scans in FY17 and the youth volunteered nearly 1,100 hours of community service. The skate park budget is located on page 223 and is up 10.8%. There are no significant changes in this activity. In FY17, we had approximately 3,200 visits and 130 participants in our lessons. Our department began working with economic development on a feasibility study for the site. Casey Community Center begins on page 223 and is up 2.7%. There are no significant changes in this activity. 
Staff is planning for expanded programming in FY19 to include family game and movie nights and seasonal themed events. With renovations to this facility, we saw an increase of 140 bookings in FY17 over FY16. That's 140 net increase? Um, correct. Wow. wow, that's pretty good. With the renovations Those... to the kitchen and all of that. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. A water park budget begins on page 233 and is up 10%. Furniture and equipment e increased $25,000 to support replacing the aging emergency announcement system. The current public address system is the original equipment installed when the facility opened 28 years ago. <laughs> this attraction averages close to 80,000 patrons annually from Memorial Day through Labor Day. Arts Barn starts on page 240 and is up 1.4%. There are no significant changes in this activity. Ticketfly, our online ticket service, continues to be very successful. We currently have more than 3,500 subscribers who have purchased tickets for one or more performances. We are now exploring the use of Ticketfly, which was recently bought out by Eventbrite, for other events and facilities. And the percentage of available tickets sold for the Arts Barns shows is 75%, which is excellent compared to the industry standard of 65%. The Old Town Youth Center budget is located on page 246 and is up a half a percent. There are no significant changes. The center, which serves students from Gaithersburg and Forest Oak Middle Schools, had record attendance in FY17 with nearly 20,000 membership scans and the youth volunteered over 1,200 hours of community service. The Benjamin Gaither Center. Can I ask you about sure. uh, the Old Town Youth Center? I mean, here you've got, um, you know, another facility that we staff where the increase is not so significant despite the overall impact of minimum wage increases what's the reason for that is that just because we we have vacancies or what's going on there so um, the part-time salaries increased about thirty five hundred dollars and um, then we also had a thirty five hundred dollar minimum wage impact it's but, mostly yeah. staffed by full timers. Right, that, correct. Yeah. And they're not at minimum wage. And they're not at minimum wage. Correct. So they don't, okay, got it. Okay. Um, Benjamin Gaither Center is located on page 250 and is down 2.8%. Instructor services decreased by $5,720 to reflect actual expenditures. This facility continues to thrive, serving our seniors. Annually, we averaged approximately 30,500 membership scans, transport an average of 4,800 <coughs> seniors to and from the center and serve nearly 8,000 lunches. And our fitness class participation continues to increase and we had over 12,400 people taking classes at that center. Are those numbers up signif uh, significantly over the previous year? It is, in everything is increasing um, from over FY16. Um, across the board. Mm -hmm. It's good that we invested in the facility. <laughs> the activity center um, budget begins on page 256 and is up 2.4 percent. There are no significant changes. The activity center continues to be a popular venue for a variety of multicultural sporting and community events. It is scheduled to be an early voting center for the Goober National primary elections in June and the general elections in October. And the Aquatic Center budget is located on page 260 and is down 0.2%. There are no significant changes in this activity. Swim lessons, swim classes, and water exercise programs remain very popular, and staff continues to offer lifeguard classes throughout the year. These classes serve not only the public, but are a great recruitment tool for the city for us to recruit staff. Miniature Golf Course budget is located on page 265 and is down 11.5%. There are no significant changes, and we're looking forward to kicking off the 2018 season next Saturday on May 5th. How is it that the budget yeah, came down so much? Down. That part-time salaries decreased for a little close to $5,000 due to actuals and a vacancy credit. Okay, Picnic Pavilions uh, budget is located on page 269 and is down 0.2%. There are no significant changes. 
Weekend time slots at Boer Park are filling fast. The main pavilions are at 75% capacity, and we expect the weekends to be completely booked by June 1st. I love the picnic pavilions. <laughs> they are, it's such an easy element for us to maintain, and yet they just, people just use them and rent them out and rent them out. They're just great. Mm -hmm. well, it's because With little have, expense. <laughs> yeah. It's because we have such nice park facilities that they want Absolutely. to. Absolutely. Go ahead, Michelle. Winter Lights budget begins on page 271 and is down 15.8%. Miscellaneous professional services is decreasing $47,200 due to electrical infrastructure upgrades that will occur in FY18. These improvements will facilitate better set, better display setup, resulting in a reduction in the work hours of DPW. That's a pretty significant savings. Okay, special events budget is located on page 275 and is up 1.7%. This account supports our four signature events, Summerfest, Oktoberfest, the Winter Lights Festival, Oops. and the Book Festival, which is coming up quickly on May 19th, in addition to all of our 120 community events. We are pleased that we have nearly 2,000 hours of volunteer hours to support our efforts. There are two significant changes. Software maintenance agreements decreased $14,175 as we're eliminated, eliminating the mobile app and migrating this customer service to the city's new website. So that's what you were asking about earlier. Mm -hmm. And miscellaneous professional services is increasing $7,960 to set aside funding for the commemoration of the 10th annual Gaithersburg Book Festival. So there'll no longer be an events mobile app? Correct, the because it's the, the so. city's new website will have a uh, will operate like the mobile app did, where we'll be able to um, update real time information um, for bands and um, food vendors and different mm -hmm. things like that that the mobile app did. The museum budget begins on page two eighty five and is up nine point eight percent. There are no significant changes. Staff is developing programs and events for the newly renovated Old Town Plaza. In addition, we look forward to working on the soon to be reconfigured rolling stock. The new plaza will be utilized during Heritage Days in June and staff is planning a STEM activity related to water in July. Staff is working with local businesses and a representative from the Maryland State Wineries is scheduling a visit to see if the site could be used for a wine tasting event. And is, the, uh, is the, again, the 9.8% um, the on the slightly higher side, is that also, again, because of minimum wage or something else? Mm, Part-time salaries decreased. <coughs> I see health insurance. I see full-time wages. 1437. <laughs> So, okay. um, health insurance. So, so, thank you. So it's on the personnel side. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Michelle, can I ask a question? On page 278, it talks about sponsorship coordinator, uh, line item cost 29870 um, I don't necessarily need an answer now, but if you could follow up with uh, the rate of return on that, are we seeing significant um, sponsorship revenue coming in for that? or? We are. So um, the, the last report, that we had, I actually have a handout for that. So our FY17 year-end report was um, we had $66,000 in cash sponsorships and $50,000 in in-kind sponsorships. So that there's probably actually more in kind that's just not reported anymore. But I did following up on Rob's question, mm -hmm. um, I heard that our sponsorship coordinator is not going to be there for long. Like she's she's moving across the country. Correct. Um, so I'm assuming that we're going to find somebody else to fill this role. We're going into discussions with the city manager. Mm -hmm. Okay. Shortly. To, to, I to think discuss what our role. options are. Yeah, I think there's the more least. opportunity than, than, I think there's opportunity to grow what that 
coordinator brings in. The the, court, the, the effort will continue, mm -hmm. yeah. depending on whether it, it's this part-timer or whether it, it this part-time job could be combined with other part-time jobs that would take it over. But at the end of the day, the effort will continue. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, and finally, the Kentlands Mansion budget is located on page 289 and is up 3.8%. There are no significant changes. The mansion hosted 154 events in FY17, and we're looking forward to the completion of the new side garden this spring. Staff will be programming it with events such as yappy hours, concerts, and more, as well as renting out this space as a venue. So overall, again, the department is up 2.9%. The FY19 minimum wage impact of $11.50 to $12.25 for our department is projected to be $52,085. Staff has forecasted an additional $335, $528 in revenue for FY19 to offset this impact. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome, Kevin. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm uh, sitting in for Director Schlichting tonight, who is attending the American Planning Association Conference in New Orleans. Um, the Planning and Code budget begins on page 294. The Planning Department is comprised of five divisions, including Administration, Planning, Permits and Inspections, Neighborhood Services, and Animal Control. The FY19 proposed departmental uh, budget is up 4.6% from FY18. Uh, moving on to the activities uh, in um, activity uh, 1192, which is administration on page 299. Uh, it, administration is up 4.1% with a slight increase in part-time hours to adequate, adequately staff the front counter at City Hall. Uh, on page 304, it's activity 1194, which is planning. Planning is up 2.5% with two significant changes. One is the decrease of $20,000 in engineering and architecture consulting fees as we were encouraged to remove funding for these services and provide them in-house instead. Uh, the, other increase is an, the other is an increase in our travel budget of $6,450 to allow for more staff to attend professional conferences. On page 309, uh, it's activity 1196, which is permits and inspections. It is up 2.3% with two significant changes. One is a decrease of 34,000 in vehicles since we won't be purchasing one in FY19 as we did in FY18. Uh, the other is an increase of $9,310 <coughs> in conference registrations for added certification requirements. And then on page 314, it's activity 1197, which is neighborhood services. It is up 15.9% with one significant change, an increase of $30,000 in vehicles for the anticipated addition of one full-time code administration officer that will help with our serve, to help serve our growing city. Um, on page 319, activity 1198, animal control is down 3.1%. What's the reason for that reduction? I mean, it's... Um, it was it contributed to um, the retirement, retirement of senior staff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Makes sense. That's what I thought it might be. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for verifying that. That all you got, Kevin? That's it. All right. All right. All right. So quick and easy. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, police. <coughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. Mark Swerker, Chief of Police. The Police Department budget begins on page 324, and the significant changes begin on page <coughs> 325. The first significant change is under account police weapons. This decreased by $38,820. This is a result of not having to purchase ammunition in FY19. We previously purchased two years' worth of ammunition due to delays in deliveries and ammunition shortages. However, we currently have a sufficient supply of ammunition and we won't be making any purchases uh, in FY19. Under account software licenses, the increase of $6,200 is primarily due to the purchase of additional software for our following queue system, which will assist us in tracking quartermaster supplies. 
Also, that increase is due in part, at least for $700, for the software licenses for the two <coughs> new cadet positions. The third item, under account software maintenance agreements, this decreased by $14,971 as a result of the elimination of three software maintenance agreements that are no longer uh, needed. The crime analyst identified software um, that me better meets our needs, making the previous software obsolete. Under account miscellaneous professional services, the increase of $9,808 is primarily due to the promotional process consultant fee to administer the corporal and sergeant promotional process in FY19. Under account conference seminar and class registration, this increase by $9,870 is primarily due to 10,000 being budgeted for new officer academy entry level training. Under account police forfeiture expenditures, um, there was an increase of $5,000 due, due to a projected use uh, of police forfeiture funds of $10,000 based on prior the prior year uh, usage. The under account primary uh, under the account uh, repair and maintenance machinery and equipment, this decreased by 17,000. $17,345 uh, due to the mobile data computer maintenance funds um, decreasing by $14,000 and elimination of the in-car wireless maintenance uh, funding. Um, under account vehicles and motor vehicle equipment, uh, this decreased by $19,500 because in FY18 we pur purchased a second parking enforcement vehicle. We will not be purchasing any parking enforcement vehicles in FY19. On page 326 in the chart labeled Police Department Budget Summary, under the column FY19 Proposed Budget, it shows that personnel costs are $8,685,781 or 92.2% of the department's uh, budget with operating expenses totaling totaling $734,693 or 7.8% of the department's budget, which equates to the proposed budget of $9,420,474. The total proposed budget in FY19 is a $210,389 increase compared to the FY18 adopted budget. How did we uh, save almost 5% on operating? We went through each um, line item budget, a big part of that, um, and we reduced costs where we could, but the big reduction happened, had to do with the ammunition that we didn't have to purchase. All right. Great. Question about uh, the line item for police forfeiture expenditures. Mm -hmm. um, Chief, you said that the, there was an increase of 5000 due to projected uh, use of funds of 10000 Yes. Uh, based on last year's expenditures as historical data. This isn't the actual money that comes in from forfeitures, right? This is the budgeted amount used to handle forfeitures and, and process them? This is the, it's in our um, forfeiture account. The, the money is initially seized. Okay. We go through forfeiture <clears throat> proceedings, and then that's turned over to the city and, and remains in a separate account from the general fund in a forfeiture account. Yeah, so it's an and account that rolls over from year to year and you it does. budget how much you think you're going to need from it each year. Based on prior year's usage. Got it. Okay. And um, can it just be used to supplement any expenses of the department or is, does it have to be used for specific purposes? It has to be used for official police purposes and what I use that account for is um, un unanticipated expenses that arise that are not budgeted in our general fund. Uh, for example, we um, some of the money we bought in FY18 so far, this is as of April 13th, we were budgeted uh, $5,000, <coughs> and as of April 13th, we spent $8,175 for a new kennel for the new canine dog. We didn't know we were going to have to retire the dog as early as we did, so that was un unanticipated. Right. So we bought that the kennel. We used uh, the money for de-escalation uh, training. We paid for a consultant to look at our use of force review of our policy mm -hmm. and make recommendations uh, to, to our policy to change. Um, and it's also, there's fees associated with filing for the forfeiture uh, proceedings. Uh, the advertisements in the newspaper, right. the right. sheriff's office over the paperwork, so there's other fees we draw from that account. Yeah, that's what I was alluding to earlier is that portion of it, but I wasn't sure how much that eats up of the amount. But all of those 
purposes that you listed are very good and noble purposes. I'm glad to see us spending money on those things. Um, do you, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, Chief. Do you happen to know off the top of your head um, how much money is in that forfeiture account overall? $86,849. I guess you do know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> So, Chief, you've got a rather precise number for the part-time personnel. What does that represent? The part-time, we have um, seven uh, part-time. That's our police service aides, um, par parking enforcement officer, um, front desk staff or police service aides that are there. So they're for our... Um, the new, two new cadets. And the well. two new cadet positions. Each cadet position is about $21,000 per person, and they're going to be a part-time capacity. Good. Good. I just want to comment. I'm glad to see our investment in training. I think that's probably one of the most important activities <coughs> that your department conducts. I think when we see problems throughout the country, it often reflects the, uh, the fact that many departments don't spend, don't invest in, as much time and attention to training in all aspects of police work. And I think in particular the uh, the de-escalation training and the training that uh, orients your officers to dealing with in individuals who might have uh, mental health issues, uh, developmental disabilities, et cetera, is very important. Uh, it shows that we have a caring department, but also that our, our uh, your major objective is to keep the community safe without harming anybody, including those people who might be causing problems for the community. <coughs> yeah. In every uh, police citizen encounter, we strive to resolve it peacefully without having to use force. However, in some situations, um, force is essential to accomplish uh, law enforcement objectives. However, we want to do it in such a way that we're using the minimal amount of force necessary to overcome the resistance offer, being offered, the resistance being offered to the officer in an effort for the officer not to get hurt, but also not to hurt the citizen. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, Public Works. Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. Mike Johnson, Director of Public Works, representing the Public Works Department. Public Works uh, is comprised of four divisions. And the department uh, continues to use a data-centered basis to track and improve asset condition as well as uh, our service delivery. For FY19, the department's overall budget will increase by 7.7%. Um, the department is comprised of 30 activities. And the budget begins on page 338 of your packet, with significant changes beginning on page 339. Um, starting with the um, significant changes, 1150 facilities management, that begins on page 348. Uh, 526-000 machinery and equipment increased, saw an increase of $15,600. That's for a vehicle with a radio and light bar as part of our fleet um, enhancement. Um, engineering and architecture, that saw a decrease of $7,500. And the reason for that is that the parking lot assessments will be tied to our overall pavement management um, activity, so it's not needed in this uh, particular um, object. Uh, miscellaneous professional services increased by 17,600. Uh, this is for uh, two follow visits for maintenance connection, which is our uh, CMMS system that we've recently acquired for the facilities uh, division. Um, each visit uh, entails a five-day um, rotation for the contractor. Uh, contract maintenance services that saw an increase of 22,646. Um, a number of new contracts have been added, um, which include uh, roofing inspections, um, overhead door uh, work, fire extinguisher replacements, and switchgear testing, um, which are for our generators. Uh, part of the um, overall safety enhancement in our facilities. 
Uh, conference, seminar, and class registrations increased by $6,085. And that's uh, to account for the uh, requested additional FTE uh, training. We have a great commitment to keeping our staff trained. Um, the work that they do is increasingly compli complex and regulatory in nature. And um, this is a solid investment to keep staff, you know, on the cutting edge. Uh, gasoline expense uh, increased by $6,125. Um, the actuals from fiscal year 17 were um, almost $10,000. Uh, so it's based on uh, taking a look at the historical expenditures and trying to harmonize the cost. Um, buildings and facilities increased by $306,500. And for these, we have um, additional service contracts for painting, carpet, flooring, maintenance of general maintenance of building equipments and roofing. Um, R&M machinery and equipment increased by fifty-five thousand, and that account um, increased as the budget for several small pieces of equipment were moved from the CIP into the operating budget. Uh, machinery and equipment. Um, this is uh, attached to the new hire um, for a new bulk fuel trailer for filling generators. The staff person would be responsible for keeping the generators topped up and ready in the event of, um, that they're needed. Uh, vehicles, motor equipment. I'm oh, sorry, I covered that. Um, the, the next item is 1151, Buildings and Ground City Hall, and that begins on page 356. Um, Electric saw a reduction of $10,000, and that's just a, a rebalancing based on historical usage. Uh, 1153, Buildings and Grounds Public Service Facility, and that's really the public works uh, facility, uh, begins on page 360. Um, solid waste and recycling saw an increase of 95, 90, 96, $9,596. And that's an increase in service based on the demand um, at, of the facility and the lack of uh, space to provide um, additional containers other than carts. Buildings and facilities, um, that's uh, saw an, a decrease of $10,000, and that's again a rebalancing of r &M funds based on historical usage and um, expenditure of money. 1158, Kentland's Mansion begins on page 364, and that saw an increase of $5,781. The contract maintenance services, uh, that increased um, due to three new contracts for window washing, at the second and third story windows. Um, water treatment was uh, typically, was previously paid out of the R&M um, line. Um, R&M buildings and facilities saw a decrease of $15,000, and that's uh, last year we had, last fiscal year we had a, a, a project to repoint the chimney. That was removed, so it was a one-time expense, so that accounts for that um, change. 1160, the KC Community Center begins on page 368. And um, water saw an increase of $5,800. Additional water is, um, is being used due to the kitchen and dishwasher being used more after renovation. And that's sort of what um, Michelle um, alluded to with the increased um, uh, programming of that space, programming use of that space. Um, the r &M, Buildings and Facilities, uh, that project, um, last year we did an LED upgrade for interior and parking lot lights that's no longer needed, so that's been reduced by that amount. 1161, Buildings and Grounds, Old Town Pavilion, that begins on page 370. Uh, we, buildings and Facilities <coughs> saw a decrease of $8,000. Um, last year, an LED project was um, completed on the bandstand, and you know that's that's the, the cost has just been brought down to what is more likely to be this year, and minus that special project. 1162 buildings and grounds, um, the public safety facility, that begins on page 372. Um, electric saw an increase of twelve thousand dollars. 
Um, the two-year average um, has shown showed that uh, this figure was under budgeted, so it's just a you know a, a correction to bring us in line with likely expenditures, what we feel are more likely expenditures. R and M buildings and facilities. Again, um, they're based on two-year average. The uh, building of the building uh, maintenance, the, the building will undergo a major renovation, and R and M costs are expected to go down by the five thousand dollars. Eleven sixty-four buildings and grounds, Gaithersburg Aquatic Center, beginning on page three seventy-four. The contract maintenance services increased by fifteen thousand and thirty-nine dollars, and that's due to increase of um, money to support uh, the pool maintenance service contracts. Uh, r and buildings and facilities, uh, again a, a reduction of $6,200 and that's a removal of the one-time LED light upgrade that was performed in, in fiscal year 18. Michael, can you uh, elaborate a little bit on uh, that first line item under 1164, why the, the increase is 25000 It says that it's to support aquatics. Does, uh, I don't know, is that, is the, that programming or is that something else? It's the, not, not programming, it's um, service contracts for the pool. The, the approach that is being taken is to allow the uh, facility manager who um, is a PMP, he has gone through the PMP training, to sort of take some more ownership of many of the projects that are um, going on at this facility. Okay. So we're using service contracts to do that. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Um, 1165, uh, the activity center begins on page 376. Um, the water um, charge is um, increased by $8,500. Um, no water was budgeted in FY18. Um, but looking back in 17, approximately $8,600 was used, so we feel that's you know, a reasonable cost, an accurate cost, a projection of what it will cost us. Um, r and building and facilities, a removal of uh, one-time project costs to replace water heaters, and that causes a reduction of $16,000. 1166 buildings and grounds at Gaithersburg Arts Barn, <coughs> that begins on page 378. And the r and buildings and facilities, uh, again, a removal of a one-time project for LED uh, replacements, re uh, resulting in a $6,000 reduction over fiscal year 18. It's nice to see that we've been installing LEDs in all these facilities. Mm -hmm. yes, part, uh, yes, it's part of the strategic direction mm -hmm. as well as uh, our commitment to uh, greening the city, reducing our carbon footprint. One day we'll have it on street lights too. <laughs> One day. From your lips to Pepco's ears. Yeah. Yeah. Well, saving us money too, right? Yeah, yeah saving true. money too. That's right. Yeah. Um, 1167 buildings and grounds, uh, water park that begins on page 380. And the contract maintenance services, um, the increase was $21,563. And again, that's uh, part of the effort that was mentioned before where we're having staff at the facilities sort of um, take a bit more ownership of several of their service contracts. Um, water. Uh, that's a rebalancing of utility costs based on actual usage, and that results in a $5,000 reduction over fiscal year 18. Um, solid waste and recycling, uh, a reduction of $66.75, and the new contract price re resulted in lower costs than fiscal year 18 <coughs> pricing. Um, R&M building and facilities, a uh, reduction of $35,000. In fiscal year 18, um, Two big projects were done. Um, the office window was uh, replaced, uh, as well as um, hot, heater, hot water heater was replaced, and that's not going to be done in 19. So that accounts for the change. Um, 1172, um, the Robertson Youth Park Center, uh, beginning on page 389. Um, the R&M buildings and facilities uh, saw an increase of $10,000. The one-time project request um, to replace all interior doors and frames that um, are warping and uh, causing a lot of maintenance um, effort on the part of our staff. So we're, we're going to replace them and that should result in an overall reduction in cost. Is that an issue that's just um, localized to this facility for whatever reason? 
Um, uh, it's, it appears to be localized to this facility. Okay. Right. It's not. Um, it's not across all the facilities. Okay. Uh, we're not really sure why it occurred. Uh, it might have been something to do the, during the construction phase. Where right. Were it's these the, the materials used <coughs> to make the doors and frames? Were that was that all recycled? Materials. It, it well, might have something, something to do with that because that? it was a, a very lead, one of the first lead uh, type of projects that were done. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, over time with those types of materials, um, time tells you whether it's a, it's a good item to use or reuse, continue to reuse. So in replacing those, we're still going to use such materials that fit with the character and the so intent of the building, right? No, you'll yeah, we'll go to the... We're going to go back to metal doors. We'll go back to metal doors, so... Okay. Back to the tried and true. I don't know. Well, as long as we don't lose our lead rating, I think that's the key, right? It's already expired. So. It's already expired. Mm -hmm. How do we get back? Um, 1173, uh, Gaithersburg CPSC Park site, beginning on page 391. Um, electric cost reduced by $5,000, and that's again a, a balancing of utility costs based on actual usage. Um, 1175, the parking facility, the Old Town Parking Facility, beginning on page 393. Uh, contract cleaning increased by 11,082. Uh, this facility um, has very heavy wear and tear, and uh, this is an effort to increase the daily cleaning from four hours to six hours per day uh, for the five days a week. Um, a lot of the stairwells are misappropriated. Um, <laughs> And it, you know this would help us to sort of, you know, so diplomatic. Yeah. That was very Keep diplomatic. Keep a more uh, helpful environment <laughs> in, the, in the facility. <laughs> um, R and M buildings and facilities. The one-time uh, projects was was removed, and that's uh, reduced a, a reduction of twenty-five thousand um, dollars. Thirteen, twelve streets and special projects, beginning on page four hundred. Vehicles um, and motor equipment. Um, a reduction of $7,300 in fiscal year 18, a new trailer and sidewalk grinder was purchased for the streets division, and that, that's just uh, not reflected in 19, so that's the reduction. 1341, landscaping and forestry, vehicles and motor equipment uh, increased by 55500 and that's for the purchase of a three-quarter ton pickup with plow and salter. Uh, this unit would help to transport landscaping crews as part of our future planning for plowing of a crown, which will, which street, those streets will be coming on online um, soon. So, Michael, on this category, there was a pretty significant jump in wages and personnel services and full-time employee wages. Is that attributable to minimum wage issues, or is there something else going on? Uh, it's uh, attributable to if an FTE that was requested. As we are taking on crown, we have to plan for additional bodies to to deal with landscaping okay. and plowing. When, when does our responsibility to the streets and the crown development kick in? We don't have a date yet. It's, okay. it's predicated on the developers uh, turning us, turning, we have a protocol for turning a street over. Right. And when, they, when they've satisfied that, we would then um, accept the street. Okay. So none of the streets and crown, public streets and crown have been turned over yet? Not yet. They're not, they're not public yet, They're not public yet. Mm -hmm. they're all yeah. Um, 1342, um, City Stormwater, um, beginning on page 412, uh, Contract Maintenance Services, uh, a reduction of $45,000. Um, the, sand, the sand filter at the Public Works Yard, which is part of our industrial permit, and filters water from the yard before it is discharged to the surface water body, um, has experienced um, corrosion of the um, conveyance pipe, the exit pipe. <coughs> Now this, this is a fairly common problem with the type of material that was used historically when those were built. It's the corrugated metal pipe. Um, they tend to lose the bottom of the section. And it's not just peculiar to the sand filter. We, we've also experienced it on Rabbit Road and, and on several other sites where um, we've had to uh, put a concrete jacket around the base to prevent the pipe from spreading. It's largely due. I was speaking with one of our um, consultants today about that, and he's, he sees it a lot. And he was telling me that as the um, water conveys the dirt, it kind of strips the galvanizing coat off. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like an abrasive at high speed. And then the salty water comes behind and sort of sits on the steel. 
and you get um, sort of accelerated corrosion. So it's a problem that the CMP pipes tend to have. So the repair, this here uh, was felt to be better as a CIP project, not an operations project. And we would replace the pipe with um, a reinforced concrete pipe uh, replacement, which has a much longer life and is more durable. Um, 1343, uh, Municipal Park Maintenance, uh, beginning on page 414, uh, general operating supplies uh, increased by 23,400, and that's for um, additional um, safety surfacing at city playgrounds, and that's really a safety enhancement. Um, as um, Charles Reed goes to the park conferences, um, the, he, he's, he's kept abreast of the safety standards um, for playing, playing fields, and he's just um, incorporating them into ours. What, what, do, what kinds of materials are they talking about when they say safety surfacing? It's like a wood carpet type of, uh, okay. like a spongy carpet, so okay. that um, the G force when kids yep. jump in it is not as, as you know, deleterious to their bodies. Got it. Right. Thanks. Um, vehicle motor equipment, uh, reduction of a one-time purchase for a ball field machine and bat wing mower, and that reduced in a reduction, that resulted in a reduction of $38,000. Uh, mowing and bulk pickup beginning on page 419. Uh, contract maintenance services, there's an increase for new uh, mowing RFB, request for bids, um, and the $39,000 $500 or $400 would be used for contract leaf collection. Uh, you know, as we, depending on the season, it, how wet it is, you, you sometimes get more leaves, and this sort of helps our crews to stay on, you know, complete what they have to do. Um, vehicles, uh, motor equipment, a reduction of a, a one time cost for the boom, a boom truck and crew cab pickup. That purchase was made in 18, it won't be made in 19, that, so that it results in a reduction of $106,054. Uh, 1345, recycling, beginning on page Mike, four. Can I, uh, can I just throw in a reminder here? I think uh, relative to bulk pickup, uh, within the coming year, we'll probably be coming to you with some, just some concepts, proposals, whatever you call that, to, to modify the bulk pickup program to be a little bit more random um, and a little more efficient. Um, we're not sure what those things might be, but just as a reminder, that'll, that'll be part of this year's work plan. Great. Mm. Okay. Mm. And that is one of our most uh, Absolutely. popular uh, services, actually. It's a so very popular major. service, and, and um, it's popular with a lot of non-residents, too, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, right. And so that's, that's the thing we really want. That's wanna, the downside. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, okay, 1345 recycling, uh, beginning on page 423. Um, that that was, uh, saw an increase of $41,500, and that's based on the increase in the contract price based on a CPIU adjustment of 2.1% um, to the, the, the rate. Um, 1351, engineering services, beginning on page 425. Um, engineering and architecture saw a reduction of $5,000. Um, the inspection cost of the pedestrian bridge at Bloom Park um, budget, which has been performed in fiscal year 18, is removed. Um, it won't be needed in 19. And uh, the vehicle and motor equipment, um, a vehicle was purchased for our new right-of-way inspector position, which was added in fiscal year 18. We have no additional um, expenses associated with vehicular purchases for 19. So, Michael, again, in this category, there's a pretty significant jump in full-time wages. Is that due to additional FTEs? Or? That's an additional FTE. We are, are we propose to an, to hire a um, project manager for the engineering, additional project manager for engineering services. Okay. Does Ground Castle know we have a right-of-way inspector now? I'm sure they'll find out. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. um, 1393 street lighting, and that begins on page 429. And um, electric uh, saw an increase of $50,000. And that's just the, C the usual CPIU um, escalation of electricity charges. Um, R&M machinery and equipment, um, the contract um, has to be rebid. This contract, um, which is currently um, on the street, was last bid in 2005. And based on recent um, expenditures or historical expenditures, um, we project that the um, likely expenditure will be about $80,000 uh, for 
for FY19. So that result results in an $8,000 increase. Uh, 1397, traffic control beginning on page 431, <coughs> general operating supplies. And uh, that increased by $14,000, and that's for a new sign and street name, uh, blanks and thermoplastic and stop bars, uh, and thermoplastic for stop bars and crosswalks. <coughs> and those are the significant changes. Um, were there any questions on anything? So, Mike, on 1343, you've got a line item for goose abatement. Um, how do we abate those gooses? Goose. Um, there's a dog actually that is used. He's, he's not Sherlock. I, I don't know. What <laughs> but, uh, he chases them all. He, he's brought, He's a specialist in chasing um, the, the geese and uh, sort of chasing dog. them off. And <laughs> that's what's used to. We employ them. several interesting dogs. <laughs> that's really nice. <laughs> yeah. It's a different one than for the bed. It's yes, that's what he said. It's not a different. Skill it's not, it's not yeah. sure. Special it's, Watson. it's Watson. <laughs> uh, Watson. Um, I had a couple of questions. First, um, we'll get to you next. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you done? He wasn't quite done. You, go ahead. Back. Well, you finish. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, MCPS made the news for having um, lead appear in the water testing for a few of the facilities there. Do we test for lead in our facilities? And if not, sh do you recommend that we do? No. Uh, Mike and I discussed that just last week, and we uh, contracted with a consultant to look at our um, uh, outlets in all city facilities. Great Not based on any um, any complaint or any any mm -hmm. suspicion, but since MCPS has buildings that are contemporary to our buildings, we thought it was just the right thing to do. So, so that'll be done this fiscal. Okay, year. it's good to establish a baseline that allows mm -hmm. us to do that. Was that all you had, Rob? Rob? No. Okay. Did you yeah. have more or no? Um, yeah. Stay focused. There's no more geese. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Gooses. I just wanted to quickly um, follow up on the, the, the two asks I had last year. One was um, for looking at our processes for um, improvements, particularly in the green methodology in which we do stuff. Um, you'd mentioned the LED lighting replacement and the green commitment, so that's great. The other ask that I had was, um, my support for training for our, our, particularly within your department, for um, folks to go out there and learn the, the, the latest and the newest in you know, green methodologies as well. So I was wondering if, how that's going. It's going uh, quite well. Um, the, the department has uh, in, and does invest quite a bit in um, staff training, on not only of the professional staff, but also our line staff. And uh, the ultimate goal being that um, the regulations are complex and are, are changing. They're like, for instance, some of the newer ones, like green, um, green technologies, they they are evolving. So we encourage staff to go to conferences, and you know, people, folks from stormwater, staff from storm, stormwater do go, as well as um, uh, some of the other divisions um, attend those as well. And we we have a real, uh, very strong commitment to uh, staff training uh, throughout the entire length and breadth of the organization. Okay, well, thank you. And I just want to emphasize that's that an ongoing, uh, you know, ongoingly important to me. So, to the extent that you will look at new innovations in the future, new methodologies, costs for those new methodologies, I'd be supportive of that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Right, I'm back. <coughs> More focused. All right. um, first, um, we didn't talk about this because I don't think this was a significant change in the budget, but. Um, How's it going with um, uh, maintenance of the uh, organic uh, uh, turf field uh, at Lakelands Park? Um, are we feeling that the process that we've got in place for doing the maintenance is sufficient? And I know it's an extremely popular field, and we're looking at some capital projects to install other, other fields, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but I just wanted to get a sense uh, you know, regarding the maintenance issues. How that was going? Uh, the, uh, it's going well. Every, um, uh, I think, twice a year is it Mark that you have to replace. Once a year, we replace the infill, the organic mm -hmm. infill, mm -hmm. and that's done by the vendor who um, really sort of, you know, warranties the field. Right. Um, it is uh, as with as with items like this, the price of the organic infill is is costlier than if we use a, a different, you know, material. But uh, right. we don't really We're not really experiencing 
significant maintenance issues. It's just, it's well understood and it's working well. Good, okay. And then the other question I had was, it, I know that we have had some very preliminary discussions over the last couple of years and some experimental pilots on composting. Um, I don't know if you've had any um, bigger picture discussions with Tony or you know within the department generally about what this might look like if down the road the city decided to look into sort of a more serious, more comprehensive effort to do composting at the residential level. I realize that is kind of a transformational thing that we'd have to have a big discussion about. As I recall, one of the big challenges of the last couple of years, every time this was brought up, just in a kind of a, in a brainstorming session, was that um, the economics of it were tough because there just weren't a lot of places around here where you could bring the compostable material to if we were to have uh, city staff or a city vendor collecting it from, from residences and that we'd have to drive it pretty far so to the point where it starts to not become economical anymore. Um, and probably offset some of the environmental benefits if you're driving around many, many miles uh, with a gasoline-powered truck uh, to drop it off somewhere. So I don't know if you all have had any discussions about this or if I'm just kind of ambushing you with this issue, but um, I know we've, we've done it at uh, special events in a limited fashion for pilots, so I don't know, maybe that's a question for Michelle, but I, what I'm really asking more along the lines of is you know, more of a, a public works type um, broader potential approach to it if it's something that the mayor and council decide we want to look into going down the road. We've been meeting with Diane. Okay, great. And we're looking at offering composting at our farmers markets. Mm -hmm. We're not able to go and collect all residents' right. um, compost materials, but at least we'll offer two sites, um, Thursdays in Old Town and Saturdays at the Ketlands Farmers Market, okay. where um, Diane's gonna, we're working with her and trying to roll out some type of campaign where we're gonna be able to offer the um, <coughs> countertop compost bins and liners um, to so many people, um, however many she's able to obtain, and then um, we'll be able to collect items at the farmers markets in addition to at our special events, so. Okay. Is that more information forthcoming? <laughs> okay. Something that we're thinking of rolling out this summer, or yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. We were trying to get it started by May, um, but okay. it was a really tight time frame yeah. um, for the start of the farmers markets. But um, it's something we're working on. Okay. And then I would I would just ask that public works and city managers sort of keep it something on their radar screen for a possible future conversation in the years ahead as as we see where this goes. Um, Obviously, it will have serious budget implications as well, um, and it may be something we decide we don't want to do or can't do, but um, you know, this is a, g a great start, and we'll sort of see where it evolves. Right. We hit a little um, bump in the road because the, the contractor who does our special events is so full that he's not able to take on the farmer's markets. Hmm. So. Right. It shows that there's mm -hmm. demand for this. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. So since we're on this green theme, I mentioned the, I asked the question about the replacement of doors at the at the Robertson Park Youth Center. We talked, and I heard somebody said that the the lead rating, that standard or certification had expired, and I was wondering why we wouldn't do something about maintaining that certification, since we made that investment originally. Is that the case, or or? I believe the city code um, only requires that the buildings be built to lead a silver a standard, and there, there's no requirement to maintain it as, at that, uh, to maintain the... Well, the it was never, that was, I don't believe that facility was actually lead silver. I think it was, it was lead certified, but it wasn't silver. Was it silver? So? But the question is, why would we make the investment and brag about it and then not maintain the certification that we have been bragging about? Or, it, you this know, is a Tony totally question. So, so, that's why, so this is why I've asked the, the I understood. And, and since lead is, is is you know such a work in progress, we our experience with it is that we paid for the original certification and that the annual recertifications cost a lot of money and we would prefer to put it into vehicle into building maintenance <laughs> and in fixing the things that kind of didn't work out um, in lead buildings. I agree. That's with a that. simple Well, I think it's you know, I we've we've uh, taken the strategic direction that we want to be a green city and I think if we build something to and with the expectation that it's going to continue to be uh, provide that that level of service uh, you know in a way it's symbolic and but I think it's a knowing, lot of money for symbolism well I don't know what the money is 
I haven't been, we don't, so. Uh, yeah, I don't know. You know, so I guess it would be helpful to have the details of what that yeah. cost would be. You know, if it, if it truly is exorbitant, then yeah, we should, we should consider that. But I think we have to know what those costs are. We did make the investment. Uh, we, we've invested in a couple of buildings that way. And I think it's important to, to maintain that standard. Just in, in the same spirit that we're talking about doing other things in a green way. Mm -hmm. So, are we talking about a name or standards? It has it the actual. We're not. I think of the building decreased since it's not. Right. Or, when we talk about maintenance, we're talking <coughs> about maintaining the the use as it was designed and built. Right. Um, which was up to the standard. Well, it was designed and built to be a green building, and if it's no longer a green building, I think we have to think about that. It's no so, longer LEED certified. So it's, it's well, like we went in and spray asbestos everywhere, or whatever the case may be. Well, there's more than that. I, I think it's something worth worth discussing and finding out what the costs are. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, if we're going to make the investment in being green, in some aspects, why not be green the whole way? So as much as we can. Okay. Thank. You. Thanks. Any other questions? Thank you, Michael. Okay. Appreciate it. Let's dive into CIP. So staff member two, who would yeah. like to leave at this point an opportunity? Yeah, um, <laughs> let me just say, let me, because I know we're going to have some department heads and, and division <clears throat> chiefs uh, take off because maybe they don't have much at stake with CIP. <clears throat> and um, on behalf of the council, uh, we, we're, we're very grateful for all the work that you've done. We didn't have a tremendous amount of questions tonight, but it's not because we're not looking deeply at this budget. It's because we really feel like you guys are capturing the policy and direction directives that we've been giving, and it really jives with the direction we want to go. So we appreciate it. And with that said, Dennis, take it away. Um, Mayor and Council, as you know, the CIP budget has changed in terms of how the format has done. It's actually fairly parallel to what the stormwater CIP has been uh, for the last few years. Um, but we have made a number of changes <clears throat> to the document and how we actually have structured the CIP. Uh, the CIP budget begins on page 442 and continues to 446. In addition, there are a number of appendices uh, related to this that have detailed project descriptions and those start on 504. Um, we discussed this a little bit at the staff re or the council retreat. Um, we've taken the CIP funds which were 30 project funds and redistributed those into six separate um, actual funds which have separate projects listed uh, within them. <clears throat> and to kind of go over those new project funds, we have the general capital projects, which is really the designated fund where we put assets in terms of savings and also do expenditures related to new city assets that would be coming online that we currently don't have or are currently servicing. So when we build out new parks or new police stations, which are some of the projects that are listed under that uh, particular CIP, that's where those are funded from in this particular category. The other aspect we use there is also contingency. Um, typically, we budget around 500 to 300,000 a year for contingency projects. Those are ones that we may not be aware of that come up through the year uh, that we fund through that particular contingency item. The second um, new fund is the infrastructure fund, and basically that serves all the sidewalks, streets, uh, bridges, and other special projects related to those. I will note that stormwater is not part of that because it's its own fund. <clears throat> the next one would be facilities, which um, encompasses all the city facilities that are not park facilities. Um, so those would be City Hall, uh, the Public Works facility, um, some of the other minor facilities that we have in terms of Wells Robertson, et cetera, um, are also in that fund. And then the fourth fund is the parks fund, uh, which includes all those facilities related to the park. So that not only includes passive and active parks, but parks buildings related to their functions in terms of their activity. All those funds, we've set a $30,000 cap for projects within those. Um, if it's under 30,000, those are budgeted in the operating budget. Um, so that's a little bit of change. We used to have an account called 98-1 
which kind of served as this little clearinghouse for all these smaller projects. We've actually placed a large portion of that within the operating budget, and you saw that um, tonight. <clears throat> the other two remaining funds, uh, the fifth <coughs> one is actually the technology fund, which we use for new hardware or new software initiatives. Um, some of those include like facility cameras when we bring new facilities online or as we upgrade facilities we have installed cameras and also um, security measures in terms of access doors. In addition like the police body camera came from that um, particular fund. Um, it has a lower threshold just because of some of the expenditures within it and it's set at 15000 um, I will note too that we typically Although we set aside funding in years four and five, we don't usually program those out just because of the way technology changes. It makes it difficult for us to do a full five-year plan on those, but we do set aside a certain balance um, to expense in the fourth and fifth years, and as we get closer to those, we um, detail those out and, um, and assign the projects to them. The final CIP fund is really the Art in Public Places, uh, which deals with art projects, some which are developer-funded, and others which are actually related to city projects. Um, we don't have a threshold for that because each of those projects is slightly different. Um, and those are the six new funds. And so... <clears throat> Dennis, may I jump in sure, for a Sure, at any time. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'd like to point out at the, uh, at the last uh, meeting of the mayor and council, it was uh, requested by a member of the public who was also a member of the planning commission that we put in the budget some crosswalk improvements that have been recommended for Kentlands and it I just want to point out that it's right here in the CIP budget number 3303 $95,000 for next year so this long away I guess it's been a couple of years since we first started talking about this so I'm glad to see this one going forward um, let's see uh, oh yes I also wanted to say that I jumped for joy at seeing the observatory park uh, project um, I hadn't realized that there was some talk about that going forward because I had brought that up uh, along with a couple of other folks a while back. But I'm really glad to see that there's, a, there's some thought being given to possibly putting a telescope in our observatory park once again. I think that would be wonderful. I agree. Yeah. That would be really cool. It would be really cool. <clears throat> so one of the new features you'll see in the CIP is actually um, detailed project pages for each of the projects. Uh, before, you know, they were somewhat worded in kind of paragraph form where you had a one sentence or actually three or four words and then the amount that we were spending. We've actually developed project pages which give the project location, kind of a more general description, and then specifically ties revenues to that particular project, whether they come from um, city transfers in terms of the transfer from the operating budget or they come from other special sources like POS money, uh, uh, public open space money, or other state grants. Um, so that's a little bit different than we've done in the past. We are hoping to <clears throat> kind of incorporate additional features in the future. So for some of these, we actually might have maps or photographs related <coughs> to the CIP projects. We're just trying to do this in kind of a piecemeal fashion, so we make sure we get all the pieces in place. And again, most of those are found in the appendix um, mm -hmm. of the document and those are on pages 500 um, starting on 500 <coughs> so I thought I would go over the, the new projects were actually listed in your <coughs> packet starting on page 445 um, we've added uh, new projects in the amount of about 4.2 million dollars <coughs> for those and I'll go through them in terms of how we've outlined the actual CIP funds. So we do have the general capital projects. We've added one, uh, two, one new project to that aspect, which was the mayor and city council chambers. We've had a lot of discussion about that, but it hasn't appeared in the CIP before. So this will be the first time it actually appears in the CIP. In addition, as uh, Neil noted, we've added one to the infrastructure um, CIP, which was the Kentlands Boulevard Crosswalk Project, um, which was um, something that we've been looking at trying to do for the last few years, but we finally have incorporated that into the actual CIP. <clears throat> we've actually added four projects to the infrastructure CIP. Um, the first one, 
and actually the first three really deal with kind of assessments. Um, one of the things we've been trying to do with our CIP because we're a pay-as-you-go city is determine how much money should we be setting aside for general maintenance and ongoing maintenance of our facilities. And so <clears throat> we actually have two assessment facility um, projects going on, one for the activity center and then one for Casey Community Center. We have just or are about to complete uh, Ketlin's Mansion, which you'll see a project that's uh, relative to that assessment, and then also City Hall is being completed uh, this year. The other one we're doing is a pavement assessment program for the city parking lots, similar to what we've done for the streets, but we're actually doing it for all our city parking lots. And then as noted by Mike, when he talked about the sand um, outfall replacement for the public works facility, that is now incorporated into the CIP. We've actually added seven projects related to the parks CIP. Um, one of them would be the community museum, HVAC and storage enclosure. We're incorporating this into the relocation of the bug car. Uh, this would be the time to do it. Um, so we're looking at trying to provide maybe a little bit more storage, but also a little bit better screening of the HVAC units there at the museum complex. And then as Neil noted again, um, we're doing a study for Observatory Park to look at modifications and possible placement of an actual telescope um, at that facility. <clears throat> as I noted earlier, one of the outcomes of the Ketlin's Mansion study was to kind of prioritize and look at um, the various aspects that Park and Rec would like to see at that facility along with maintenance. And one of them was the permanent porch enclosure. Um, so that has been included in the CIP. Uh, we will also be doing Diamond Farms Park Court um, number three, some lighting related to that. And that's kind of um, a little bit different than our other lighting projects. And we're looking at kind of pickleball courts at those particular facilities, which is a new activity that the Parks and Rec have been doing uh, for the last couple of years. Mayor thinks that's very important. Right now. I know something. So especially the pickleball happy. stuff. We Pickleball's have, uh, really fun. <laughs> just, just saying. Yeah. Uh, we have a trail replacement um, for Washingtonian Woods Park, which is a, approximately a mile long. This is probably the first uh, replacement that we've done of that, of any major trail. We've done some minor improvements, but this will replace the entire trail path. We also have the Community Center electronic sign, um, similar to the one that's at Bora Park now. And then we have the gym partition replacement um, between the two gym facilities. And then finally, under the Arts and Public Places, we actually have added two new CIPs, uh, City Event Banners Project, um, which will allow us to do some banners in the uh, 355 corridor, um, specializing on which city events that we have mm -hmm. and activities related to that, similar to what we do when we have flags and other um, advertising events. And then we also have additional funding set aside for 16 South Summit, which is the new police station of doing a public art project um, <clears throat> at that particular facility. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have on the new projects. And then I was just gonna touch base on a few um, existing pro projects that we have to kind of update you on those. I just have one quick question and Denise may have the answer and maybe you have the answer or not Dennis, but uh, Denise and I have been, and Tony have been talking about a potential project to do some sort of public art pro um, on the back of the brick wall on East Diamond uh, and perhaps in incorporating some of the parking garage there. And I didn't know if that was going to be, if any part of that was going to be included in this budget or if we're just waiting till next budget to look at that or if something else is going on there. Now that's actually currently in the CIP as an existing project because we've been talking about it over the last year and a half or so. Um, so that's the Old Town Art Project, which is project number 92. Oh, okay. Uh, there's roughly... I thought it was a new project, but I guess it's it, not. Roughly about 500000 for that particular project. Okay. Um, so it's already budgeted. All right. Thank you, Dennis. So <clears throat> back to, the, to our green and sustainable approach to doing things. <clears throat> uh, we, you know, the uh, the path on Main Street that was uh, that the county finally installed. Um, uh, we had talked for a long time about using pervious materials on that path, and apparently we couldn't do that because the county decided to to do that. Correct? We installed that. Path. We installed that path. The county, but we did, didn't. The county did not. 
okay. want to have pervious pavement there. Uh, and also the grade yeah. was great enough that it was going to That it wasn't going to make any difference. Anyway. Okay. But so I guess I would. Expensive. So we're talking about the. Yeah. So with the path replacement of Washingtonian Woods, there potential there as well as as our uh, as the infrastructure related to the city parking lot might I don't know if those are options but I think we should always consider places where we might do this we will look as at part that. of our stormwater uh, strategy and then also I should strategy. note that the current um, pavement being proposed for Metamune Park is mm -hmm. actually flexi pave which is a porous pavement material it's a little bit different than porous pavement it's a little mm -hmm. bit more flexible than that um, so that's currently being proposed for Metamine Park for the mm -hmm. entire trail system. So it would be kind of a first model. We want to do some yeah. testing of that. That would be the first place we would actually install it and then see how it's working, similar to what we do with the synthetic fields. You know, we do a project, we see how it works, and then we move forward <laughs> if we think it's doing okay. Yeah. So, well, Mike, that is on the agenda in terms no, of I, I, a good, project I'm glad to that hear that come because up. I think it has to be part of our over overall stormwater management strategy and, and then is i should also note that um, it's kind of our project um, but being funded by the state is the nist path right. on 124 will be a porous pavement um, project too so we will have some new projects to look at and see how well they do good thank you <clears throat> any other questions on new projects um, in terms of some of the older projects I wanted to update you on, uh, the police station project, which is on page uh, 510 of the packet. I just wanted to let you know that we're currently looking at that project in terms of funding and the budget um, that's coming forward. We have some new budget estimates that are coming back. Um, to be honest, we're a little concerned about some of the things we're hearing from a construction standpoint um, related to some of the tariffs and just the number of projects that are coming online. Uh, within the general metropolitan area. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that we're, we're looking at alternatives for some of those projects to make sure that we come in on budget on that. Um, so I just wanted to make you aware of that. That's a pretty significant project for us. Definitely. Um, you know, we're currently at roughly um, 12 million for that particular project. Um, and then we have the council chambers on, on top of that. Yeah, we also were looking, had been looking for a bond bill, right, for that project? Right. We have, but we were not able to secure a bond right. bill from either the Senate or right. the delegate side. We have had a conversation today of looking at other alternatives uh, with the governor's office, so That's we will be pursuing um, those. Um, we have talking, spoken with uh, two senators regarding that particular aspect, and we'll be working in the interim to try to develop a plan for that uh, with the hope that we try to at least get some indication of whether that funding would come forward before we accept any bid on the police station uh, should we have issues with being over uh, the proposed budget when the bids come back. Thank you. So this may be the first significant project where the tariffs are likely to have an impact on the overall cost. It's really so hard to predict right now, yeah. um, but you know, everyone's looking at that particular aspect, partly because it's so unknown. Yeah. Uh, there's not a lot of steel in it, but there is a lot of aluminum in it. Um, again, most of the studs will be made of aluminum, and so the building is being gutted and reconfigured from that standpoint. So um, it all depends on who gets exempted from the tariff and who doesn't and how all that works. And I'm not sure we'll know that before we actually go out to bid even, um, given the current status of the federal government. Well, you yeah, know, I think it's important for the public to know that as well. So, I mean, these are the consequences of some decisions made. At a, at a higher level and the, you know that that does ripple down it does you know yeah it cascades down to the municipal level where you don't usually think about it um, one of the other projects we made modifications to which was the cps the former cpsc site or the consumer protection safety site um, off of darnstown road that's on page 514. we've actually actually added quite a bit of additional funding to this project um, to kind of bring it in line with what we think is uh, the right solution in terms of the park itself and then the building modification. So we've actually added uh, $1.8 million to that project, um, mostly from project open space funding. So not from the general fund, but from the allocation that we receive for project open space. 
Um, in addition, uh, one of the projects uh, that we're actually looking at re reconsidering and trying to reevaluate based upon new cost estimates is related to the vehicle bay wash at the Public Works, which is on page 555. Uh, the original budget for that was roughly 500,000. Uh, the new estimates are coming in more at 825, 825,000. And so staff is going to go back and reevaluate whether um, constructing a facility that can handle all our vehicles. Um, you know, originally the approach was we'd be able to do police vehicles, city vehicles, and trucks, and whether that's still doable and whether that seems to be a good cost benefit analysis or if we should reduce the scope or look for other alternatives in how we clean our vehicles um, for the, the long term. Um, so that one may actually disappear or may be morphed or modified uh, when the budget comes back to you. Do we have a sense of what the tipping point is in terms of I, the honestly, change in maintenance, uh, uh, this kind of yeah, actually, maintenance and the cost of replacing those vehicles if they <clears throat> don't last as long? Um, I think we're trying to wash now. We would probably end up having to create a wash bay for the larger vehicles that we could do because currently we wash those in the yard and that's really not something we can continue to do under our industrial permit. Um, so we're going to have to look at all those issues that come together. So I don't have a good analysis at this point, but uh, when we bring the budget back, I may actually send you a separate email saying here's what we decided to do uh, regarding that particular project. And then the final project I wanted to bring to your attention um, is the water park slide replacement, which is on page 564 of the packet. We've actually increased that budget by 400,000 <coughs> partially to try and be in line with what's currently at the park in terms of height of the slide. It's a little bit of a specialty project. Uh, we could build the slide for cheaper if we didn't build it as high. There's been some change in terms of what the manufacturers do as a standard height, um, and we are exceeding that height. Um, what we had originally budgeted was 800000 and we believed we could do that project, um, but Park and Rec had requested to try and maintain the existing height and the existing feature for that particular facility. So the project now is at $1.2 million. We like the height. People are used to having a, a real slide in our park. <laughs> Not some baby slide, it's a real slide. It's amazing what um, 10 feet will actually cost you because <laughs> it's not that much in terms of height difference but yeah what does a I guess a shorter slide mean in terms of the, the feature and the excitement it, it, it can still have yeah. the same excitement to some degree yeah. it's just a matter of um, degree of you know how high you're up so I'd be happy to reconsider that or look at that if that's the direction of council but I mean, I don't. I, I hate to sound unpopular here, know. but that's an extra four hundred thousand dollars for, for an extra feet. ten feet of height. Um, it does change things a bit if it's four hundred grand for ten feet. Yeah, we could bid it as two. It, it gets hard because this is a design build aspect, yeah. um, so it gets hard for us to say, okay, it's gonna. You could have one or two heights. We might be able to work something like that out when we did the bid, and then come back to council with the options. Um, I have to think about that a little bit more of how well that would work under a design bid build project. Yeah. Uh, this, this was a topic of intense debate. I'll bet. I'll bet. <laughs> I'll because bet. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah. I'm not sure. Just because I raised the question doesn't yeah. mean I necessarily would want to go with yeah. the shorter slide. Yeah. But I mean, it's it something might surprise you that I, I came down on the side of the more expensive slide. Okay. <laughs> does, it's just the marquee um, attraction for yeah. the park. It's it's yeah. marketable. Yeah. It would be the tallest slide, I, I believe, in the county. But yeah, there, there was even some concern that it would make the park somehow too popular because it's already pretty crowded now. Uh, but you know, since the residents of Gaithersburg are funding this, with my we came down that you know that they should get the kind of the biggest baddest slide that there is. But it is a lot of money. Well, and we are we are building other parks and maintaining other parks too. So you know, four hundred thousand is a significant dent. To, yeah. In all of that, so I understand. I, I guess I'd like to see. Um, the comparisons um, that you just talked about that would be the way to look at it. I, I too think it's important to, to have that that feature that makes it unique. But I'm not sure that the that the people who come to the, the park 
come because they're, our slide is 10 feet taller than anybody else's. I think they come because of everything else that, that it offers. So, but I could be wrong. And that's an approximate size difference. So it's just a round number for me to use. But it's pretty close to that. It's not like 20 feet or 30 feet. On the, you look, <clears throat> yeah. We'll look forward to the analysis. Yeah. But again, we <laughs> like having the tallest slide. So we'll try to um, structure at least that um, project to where we could maybe look at both scopes. Um, again, I'll have to look to see if that's feasible given it's a design build. So That's really all I had unless you had additional questions about um, existing CIP projects. Um, again, I think we think it's a little bit more transparent than the old CIP in terms of you can actually look for a project, find the project, look at what the the revenue sources are coming from and then what the expenditures are and a little bit better description for the public. Yeah, the information is very good, very thorough. Um, I wanted to ask about the CPSC project, um, just in terms of ballpark timeline. Uh, I believe the description says construction will be FY19 and FY20. You all have yeah. I believe it will be late FY19 in terms of construction. Okay. Uh, one of the issues we had and the reason we added additional funding is we actually halted the design process for the building right. until we actually formalized the park design um, so we could get a better idea of the funding uh, necessary to do the building conversion. Um, and so we're in the process of doing that part now and we're actually looking at all the options related <coughs> to the building conversion. Um, because that will have some operational impacts also in terms of um, staffing and things like that. Um, so that's kind of why we've had a little bit of delay in the process. Again, it's a, uh, I, to put it in perspective, just the <coughs> access road is in excess of $1 million because it's so far into the site. Right. Um, and it's not constructed to any standard no, it's at a this mess. particular right. point. So right. um, I just want to put that in perspective for the public. Mike. I, yeah, so one of the things we talked about at the retreat was the, uh, the manor house at, at Boar Park and the status of it. Uh, is it is it in here in the CIP anywhere? There's no or additional. Or is it under operating? Yeah, there is no additional um, CIP funding for that. Um, we have put a little bit more and have been using some of the funds we currently have to stabilize the structure um, and also stabilize some of the surrounding structures. Again, I think we would like um, some time to get some of the larger projects that we currently have in the CIP done. You know, we have two existing parks um, that are pretty large parks projects that we're currently mm -hmm. doing, sure. uh, both CPSC and, <coughs> and Metamune Park. We also have the police station, which is a very large project for us. So we weren't really comfortable adding it in at this particular point in time. We will look at it again next year to see if we can do um, some study or some other aspect of looking at what is the reuse for the manor house. Yeah. I think from a holistic standpoint, we would like to look at not just the manor house, but you also have the caretaker's house and you have the associated barn. Uh, so I think we would like to treat those as all kind of one package to make a determination of how the city could best utilize those resources. Or if we form some partnerships like we have uh, with hospice or some other people in terms of using those particular facilities. Because again, both of those, you know, the barns really used for storage. The other two facilities are actually currently vacant and have been vacant. At least, uh, you know, the cert the caretaker's house has been vacant for quite some time. Right. But if we don't maintain the condition of the buildings as, as they are now, our options are going to be limited or much more expensive. We are keeping the so, buildings, you know, in terms of enclosure, making yeah. sure they're watertight, and that if we see any structural issues that need to be addressed, we are addressing those in the most cost-effective manner right. while we work towards creating a plan. Okay. Um, so it's not like we're ignoring the structures. We are, you know, we're looking at patching the roof and things like that when we need to, or. Um, shoring well, up some things as temporary measures well that was really my question is whether that those kind of you know repairs whether they're temporary or long term or whether those are part of the cip or whether we're pulling them out of contingency or operating they would be under operating, operating. at this point because they're okay. not of a specific not large more than thirty thousand dollars okay well i guess it's good to know that it, you know to seal the buildings won't be more than thirty thousand dollars but so for instance we have a structural 
not really a big structural issue, but one of the beams appears to be sagging in the barn, so we will shore that up from a structural standpoint, mm -hmm. um, sufficient to make sure it's stabilized and able to use as storage, but we need to look at the long term what we're going to do with that particular structure too. Okay. All right. Any other questions or comments? Not seeing any. Uh, Dennis, thank you very much. Th again, thank you to all staff uh, for doing all you've done to put something together that really matches what, what we were after. You really, everyone did a really great job and we appreciate it. Um, and that said, there is no work session so Next Meredith week. actually will we cover the storm. Oh, we had storm water. Oh, storm water. <laughs> I knew it was good. Do you have to All be right. somewhere? <laughs> All right. Jeez. All right. I will stay up here. We got another 100, 108 pages. I almost let you off the hook. This is really Meredith. I was a little confused. Yeah. Storm water. Okay. Yeah. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Good evening. Uh, it's good to see everybody here tonight. Um, the Stormwater Management Fund begins on page 468 in your packet for you to follow along. And as you know, the Stormwater Fund is driven primarily by the city's stormwater permits, including the MS4 permit and the industrial permit associated with the Public Works Yard. And the fund supports operational expenses, grant programs that we run, and capital projects, including both infrastructure maintenance and then those restoration projects that we need to complete as part of the upcoming permit. So uh, the current draft budget includes specific recommendations for fiscal year 19, this upcoming fiscal year, and they include continuing with the proposed rate model increase uh, from the adopted rate model for an FY19 rate of $29.16. Um, what that means for an average, the median household of 2,500 square feet of impervious surface, that means their annual fee would increase by about $14 overall for the entire year. So um, that's up for your consideration. This was from the... The rate we were at was 22. Two. It was 2640. 26 so two four. years ago it was 2244. We are now at 2640, and we're proposing to go to 2916. And then in addition to that, we're also looking at continuing with the general fund subsidy of about a million dollars. Um, and then in FY19, revising the rate model once the new permit is issued. And then at that time, we can explore some of the issues I know council would like to re-raise, such as that million dollar contribution from the general fund. And we'll, we'll go through some of those policy uh, questions at that time. As far as significant changes go, those are on page 469 of your packet. And in 3360, that's the stormwater operating section of the stormwater fund. And the furnitures, the furniture and fixtures account will decrease by $7,950 <coughs> following completion of furnishing the stormwater division offices. So that will be going down. Under IT non-consultant services, that funding will decrease by $38,838 because we are wrapping up this current phase of the stormwater geodatabase um, redesign project, <coughs> and we don't anticipate needing any funding moving forward. Under miscellaneous professional <coughs> services, the funding will increase by $73,500 uh, $73, due to a combination of factors under that, that line item. Um, but the, the main one is that planned rerun of the rate model is increasing our need for consultant services for that. Under contract maintenance services, the funding will increase by $5,500 for things like BMP inspections and inlet and catch basin cleaning. And conference, seminar, and class registration funding is proposed to increase to 50, uh, by $5,600 to cover conference registrations for, and trainings for stormwater division staff. Um, and then that final one under 3360 for <coughs> furniture and equipment, that line item is going to be removed. It was a carryover from a withdrawn staff request, so it will not appear in the final budget. And then <coughs> under 3361, that is the stormwater infrastructure maintenance portion of the stormwater <coughs> fund. And under contributions, that funding line item will increase by $165,000 for FY19. 
And that's not actually new funding, it's unused funding from previous grant cycles that we're just rolling over and will make available to potential applicants under the city's Chesapeake Bay Trust grant program. So with that, we can <clears throat> move on to revenues and expenditures, which begin on page 472 of your packet. And the revenue is, of course, provided <coughs> primarily by the stormwater program fee. And we're looking at revenues of approximately $5 million this year from the fee. And again, that fee is assessed to all property owners and property types in the city. Um, we're also looking at an, the general fund contribution of about a million dollars and some additional transfers into the fund to cover things like the city's payment for its own impervious surfaces, um, hardships for those who are eligible, and then interest income as well. And so our total anticipated revenue for FY19 is about $6.6 .6 million. And then our expenditures are divided <coughs> into operational capital projects and then TMDL capital projects. So that's the infrastructure maintenance versus the restoration types of projects. And our total anticipated expenditures for this upcoming fiscal year are about $3.8 million. So you'll notice that our expenditures are again lower than our revenues, but we're still in that building up a fund balance portion, you know, of the phase so that we'll have money to construct our projects that are currently in design right now. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, I want to walk you through some of the projects that we have coming up for FY19. Um, in design, we have several stream restoration projects that we expect to finish final design in 19, and that includes Girard Street, Travis Avenue, and Watkins Mill stream restoration projects. Um, and then for stormwater retrofits, we are expecting the Victory Farm stormwater pond retrofit to go to final design in FY19 as well. And then as far as construction goes, we are starting to bring some of those design plans to construction. So we are planning to construct two stream restoration projects um, in FY19 near Great Seneca Highway. There's one by Lakelands Drive and then one over near the Metabune campus that will be going into construction here pretty soon. I did want to also bring up the fact that for some of these high profile stormwater restoration projects, we are going to be kind of rolling out a new outreach, pro uh, outreach process for that, which will involve the mayor and council. So um, three of the projects you can expect to have us bring before you this upcoming year are the Victory Farm Large Pond Retrofit, a <coughs> solitaire court where we're proposing a new facility, and then also the Brighton Weir, which is located in Malcolm King Park, where we may be potentially installing some sort of a pond facility, again, based on community feedback and council guidance as well. So the way we envision this working is that we will introduce the projects to council, announce a community meeting date, host that meeting, get feedback from the community that we will then incorporate into the design plans and then bring it back for a work session for for guidance for council and then of course playing it by ear based on project specifics so um, we will be seeing a lot of you this upcoming year and then one new project that we have on the books for fy19 is a drainage improvement project behind woodland road this is um, has been a resident concern for a number of years we're yes. going to actually enlarge <clears throat> the conveyance system between those homes to deal with the, the flooding that comes off the They'll CSX very happy railroad. About that. Yeah. So um, I just want to make sure, uh, and I know we've had this discussion here before, that everything, all of this stuff we're doing is going to count yes. to uh, toward our permit. I don't yes. want to spend several is, million dollars and then, and then they're like, well, no, we're measuring from today. Of course. There is written guidance now that Anything that has been implemented since 2006 can be claimed towards our permit goals. So we're going to go back and look at projects that we've done, but we're now fully confident that we can move forward with constructing these projects that we've <clears throat> sort of been just building up our design documents. Is that state guidance or federal? Guidance? State guidance, yep. Which is, is it? From Is it Maryland consonant Department? with federal guidance? Because I know there was... A lack of confidence on certain aspects of the permit. 
Gotcha. That one, yeah, there's no no question on that. All right. I have a few Go questions. Ahead, um, any any update on uh, when we think we're going to get the new permit? So I got an email this morning. It was supposed to be out March 30th. Now it's supposed to be this Friday, April 27th. This Friday. Well, this Friday is about as imminent as it's ever been. That's pretty imminent, considering it's been pushed for It was also imminent on March 30th when I thought we were going to get it. Um, but this came from the person at MDE who wrote wrote the permit and is okay. kind of the permit coordinator from Maryland Department of the Environment. Okie doke. I um, remember it seeming I imminent in 2015. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Even imminent yeah. in 20, 2008 yeah. was when yeah. it expired. Exactly. Um, a couple other questions, um, you know, and don't don't feel the need to opine on this, but okay. I, I just wanted to ask you if, if staff had any take on the county budget issues with respect to stormwater. It was a little bit of a, a headline in the county that yeah. uh, the county executive's budget uh, significantly cut uh, funding for stormwater projects. And I don't know, you know, if that was just an instance of kicking the can down the road or if there was so, some sort of legal basis to be able to say we don't actually have to spend as much as we're, we thought we did. I'm going to let Dennis, I'm going to take, take, take a crack at it first. Okay. I, don't know, right. I don't know if you are referring to the county's plan to privatize some of their restoration projects. Yeah, I think that's team. probably what you're talking about. Uh, Montgomery County, during their first permit cycle, was unable to meet their restoration goals. And so I think there were conversations between them, MDE, and EPA about how best to move forward. And it sounds like the county um, themselves made, made the decision to potentially privatize a portion of their program. Um, the impacts to us, I don't see us necessarily following the same route that they did because based on the plan that we have laid out in the CIP from now till 2025, which is when these improvements need to be in the ground, um, you know, we are very well planned out that we will have the credits that we need to fulfill this permit term. Pending some very large projects, um, but we have a good plan laid out. I will now hand it to Dennis. We actually met with um, representatives of the county, so I asked them some specific questions about that. Um, they are actually under a decree mm -hmm. to actually meet the requirements. Um, <clears throat> so they're looking at going back and actually reassessing the credits that they should have um, gotten. I believe they think one of the issues that they have not looked at very well would be new redevelopment projects that have happened in the county that weren't necessarily county projects, but should be eligible for credits. Um, so they're going back and reevaluating all those. And as Meredith pointed out, that I don't know what their timeline is in terms of how far back they can go, because um, their permit schedule is a little bit different. But even in our case, it's a specific significant number of years that you can go back and retroactively yeah. apply credits. Yeah. I believe they've indicated they weren't doing that for redevelopment projects within the county. So they think they're going to get quite a few credits regarding that and believe they will be on target, target to meet their mandate, um, the previous permit mandate okay. um, under the decree. Okay, and you said we can look back to 2006. 2006. Um, we, ha we haven't yet done that um, inventory. Have we, we have a we we do have kind of a base inventory, but we're going to do you know okay. once the permit's finally out. You know we're doing our background right now, but okay. we'll do kind of a final last best effort involving multiple departments to make sure we pull in all of the projects that could potentially apply to us. Which would in potentially include, based on what Dennis just said, uh, private. Uh, uh, land as well. Right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So okay, any redevelopment so. projects that we've had since that date yeah. actually count towards our goal yeah, okay. both, of the permit. Both new development new that's happened under significant. yeah new development yeah. Yeah. gets yeah. full credit, yeah. but then under the state manual in the city's stormwater ordinance, anything redevelopment can claim fifty percent right credit right. for it. Right. Well, so that's kind of so. uh, Mike is kind of uh, jumping to the to the to the conclusion that I was getting at, which sure. is that. It's possible we'll have a very significant increase in what we can uh, claim credit for after we do this full inventory. It's, right? it's no? a little bit complicated because 
it all goes back to our baseline impervious year, which right. they, which MBE still hasn't completely said when that will be, but most likely, <laughs> I know. So we don't know what our baseline is, but we know we can count back to 2006. 2002 is what it sounds like the impervious baseline is going to be. So a lot of that new development that's been added later, it gets credit, but it's, you know, um, it gets credit because it's providing its own stormwater, but we're really concerned about those areas that never had stormwater installed in the first place. Got it. For the okay. most part. Well, practically every, well, practically <coughs> every development um, from Lakelands up till now was built in that time frame. Yeah. So that's pretty significant. It is. Yeah. Um, did you, we, we, did I, you have one? Yeah, just one more, if you don't mind. Um, I note that at the end of our seven-year uh, uh, projection for the budget, uh, we project to have a fund balance after we have hopefully uh, complied with our target of uh, 19 million plus. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty significant um, leftover amount in the bank. And I understand the idea is that this this effort doesn't suddenly cease after seven years. We have to sure. continue to do it out into the future um, indefinitely, presumably. And the idea there is to have that balance to be able to use it going forward. Mm -hmm. Have we done any sort of uh, analysis about whether that's too much, whether that's sort of right what we want to have once right. we're at the end of the seven-year process that we're focusing on right now? Sure, sure. So this is something that we're going to take a look at with, with our consultant when we go back through the rate model. Uh, exercise again because you know right now we are in year four of that five-year rate model that we adopted and so you know next year FY 20 will be that fifth year all the numbers that are you know from FY 21 out are just kind of carry over and so right now they're not necessarily sized to what we're looking at but we anticipate when we really take a look at this program with what our specific permit is really digging into some of those issues. Okay, because I mean, I think we all believe in this cause, not only that we have to do it because it's a mandate, but we understand the long-term benefits environmentally and in terms of sustainability, but at the same time, we want to balance, you know, how much we're doing and how much money we're putting aside with, you know, other priorities we have and, sure. you know, the taxpayer's dollar and, you know, making sure that we're not kind of um, ending up with too much money sitting in the bank at the end of seven years, but I understand this. We're talking about tens of millions of dollars worth of projects that need to happen, mm -hmm. so um, we do need to invest in that. But uh, we just sort of need to be careful about how we're budgeting in the out years and trying to figure out what makes the most sense in terms of the cost and the benefit. Absolutely, and that is a concern of ours. We don't want to be taking in people's money when we're not using it, that's just not a good business practice. So, we'll be sure to keep that in mind. I would also say that some of the project costs haven't been quite determined yet on some of the larger projects mm -hmm. that we're doing, so I wouldn't anticipate the fund balance to be that high. Because mm -hmm. um, even though the model goes out seven years, <coughs> we only show a five-year CIP, so mm -hmm. some of that funding will be expended in seven, in the seventh, sixth and seventh right. year. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so as Meredith said, we will refine those as we go through the next rate model. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> I also want to point out for some of the projects that we have on Slate, these are really important projects for us to meet our mandate and will be difficult discussions with the public. So I want to be very upfront with the council that there will need to be a lot of support if we're actually going to meet our requirements <clears throat> under the current projects that we have slated. So for instance, Victory Farm is a very large project. Um, it involves increasing the pond size significantly. And, and establishing a, a <clears throat> larger wet pool that doesn't and, currently and exist. And so, you know, we've had some experience with some of the outreach um, on a recent project. Um, so I <coughs> just want to make sure that council knows these are going to be difficult public processes. Um, but it's important for the public to understand that if we don't really achieve these goals, um, these are really some low-hanging fruit from our standpoint in terms of the cost-benefit analysis. Um, these are projects that give us the big, biggest bang for our buck, and if we're not able to accomplish those, additional projects would not give us the biggest bang for our buck. They will be more expensive as we go forward. 
So we are hoping the public understands the need to do these projects. And we are looking at ways to make them more amenities. Um, and we'll probably come back to the council with some proposals about how do we do that, especially on Victory Farm, where increasing the, the size of the facility and also the size of really the wetlands area. Can we incorporate trails? Can we incorporate other features? We don't necessarily feel comfortable paying for those aspects through the stormwater fund, but looking to the CIP to um, install some of those features as part of an overall project. But it's really critical that we get across the point that if we don't, in particular, Victory Farm is what percentage of the credits? Brighton Weir is even larger. Right. So, <laughs> and that, yeah. We, we have some pretty, you know, we only have a small number of projects, but they're large credit amounts. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just want to be clear to the public that it's going to take a lot of cooperation um, to make these projects happen, and we will do our best to make them amenities as much as we can, but we really need them to occur. I know we've gotten some public pushback on some of the other recent projects we've done, so I just want to make sure everybody's on the same Got it. playing well, table. You know, so what's the, I, I think we have to balance the, you know, the how our citizens use, how our residents use public space now if it's available. If it's an active park, it's really hard to make a case for taking that offline to build a stormwater facility with a fence around it in a prominent location, which is basically the kind of model that was proposed for the solitary court right. project. And I think, you know, that really needed to go back to the drawing board. Definitely. And um, so I was, my question about, you know, now that I know the location of the Victory Farm project, I'm less worried about the impact of building a new school in Kelly Park on that particular project. So certainly this one can proceed, but the, the impact of, of a, of a you know potentially of a school being built at that park is going to have other stormwater impacts that we're going to have to that that apparently the city is going to have to take care of as well as the county so mm -hmm. but i think the other thing about the projection we're talking about 19 million dollars in the fund in a in a few years when i delivered testimony on behalf of the city and the national league of cities to congress to a congressional committee i asked staff to calculate what our costs would be to get us up to the 20 percent target uh, of, mitig of mitigation, and over that period of time, we were looking at costs ex exceeding $40 million for all the projects that were online. So $19 million is, you know, less than half of what it would take to bring us up to meeting those, those mandated targets under the, you know, the previous permit or whatever we thought the permit was going to be. So, um, you know, we, we're going to have to continue to invest in this because the costs aren't going to go down these things are going to get more expensive and we're going to have other issues to take care of but but yeah I, look I think we're all prepared to to make a case to the public about the necessity to do these things but on the other hand we we can't take other amenities away from our residents in order to comply with this and we're going to have to figure out how to balance that and sometimes it's just going to be a more costly project uh, or more costly design and we have to think about other innovative ways to do that so that we can maintain those spaces. Go to Neil yeah. Thanks. Go ahead, Neil. No, I just <clears throat> think that the idea of, uh, of combining the stormwater mediation projects with new amenities is the right way to go. Yeah. And also, not waiting until we spring this on people would be the right approach. In other words, let's, let's think about putting working groups together with the, with the citizens of that area and bring them into the loop to find out what kind of amenities might work best for them and really do a consumer, you know, a CPSC style organization in order to mm -hmm. keep everyone on the same page and get the buy-in from the local community, I think is the only way to go without, you know, we don't want an us versus them or us versus us and the EPA versus them, right? We want, you know, we want to know what kind of amenity is uh, people are looking for. Right. Maybe a big water slide. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's stormwater management, right? If the water comes, maybe a slip and slide. Um, I just wanted to point out, um, uh, you know, I appreciate what Mike said, but I just, just for clarification, the way I read the budget is that total expenditures after seven years will be more than forty million dollars. It's the balance left over that will also be an additional nineteen million dollars. So we will, assuming that we follow something along the lines of this budget, we will spend. 
$41 million by the time of the seventh year. Right? That's, that, that's yeah. the plan. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So we'll have spent $40 million and we'll have still have to, almost $20 million $20 left million over. Left. Right. So we'll have mm -hmm. collected $60 million? Yep. Yes, that's what, that's what I'm at. getting at. That, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. That's yeah. that was the point I was making earlier. Based on something like approximately five million dollars a year average during this time period, I don't. Yeah, how did that work? It's over five million, so it's because um, well we have the rate increases. Yeah, and um, part of it was also that this was originally supposed to be a five-year period and suddenly mm -hmm. got spread and out into a seven-year period. Now it's period. spread out, so we have additional seven. years in here that were not. Yeah. No, I understand, the, but it was only a couple of extra years, right? It wasn't like extra 10 years. extra years. Like four extra years, yeah. yes, correct. Okay. Yeah. Correct. So, And, and um, that was the point I was making earlier, that we will have this $19 million left at the Again, assuming, you know, that we follow closely with the budget. I wouldn't um, get too uh, wedded to, mm -hmm. to the projections. Yeah, here. they'll change. So many they'll change. Yeah. The bigger picture was we'll have a bunch of money left over. We'll spend a whole bunch of money. We might have a bunch of money left over. We might not. Uh, we might not. But we but should we'll just have money to start the next phase. We should look at it. We should think we about it. We should think about it. It's the right amount. We're going to it completely. Generally, going to scrap these numbers once we <laughs> year to year. I think. Yeah. yeah we we'll get, year year. Hopefully, and we'll get a permit and we'll. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of yeah. like that uh, that other chart that you love that always shows that we won't have any money in three years. Oh, but I, turns out Marilyn, really. I, I believe that her numbers are perfectly yeah. accurate. <laughs> yeah. And again, and again, I, I understand the you idea go of back having. Through and look. I, under, I understand the idea of having a big balance is necessary uh, to roll into whatever the next phase is mm -hmm. after the seven years ends, but. Mm -hmm. I just want us to keep that in mind as we move forward with our, our multi-year budget. As Dennis thinks, didn't you hear me before about my cautionary? Also, you know, we have had three years where our expenditures have been fairly low because we haven't implemented projects we haven't because yep. we haven't done a permit. Yep. Yeah. In future permit cycles, we will not have that three-year cushion because yeah. the permit cycle will be a five-year cycle. We think. <clears throat> Unless things change, at we the assume, level. right? We thought this was going to be a five-year cycle, and it turned out to be a seven-year. So. Yeah. So. yeah, yeah, so, so that's what we're hoping yeah. will turn into. So you know, some of that funding is just start money to make sure we can reach the next five-year cycle, which right. will be a more expensive cycle to me because we're trying to really do the projects that we think are most cost beneficial at this particular point. It may be. I get it. I get it. it. Be. I'm just po I'm just pointing that out for consideration. Right. Right. Rob. So in looking back to <coughs> 2006, if it turns out that we do, we exceed the requirements, can, can we sell those credits to the county to, for them to meet their requirements? That's possible. So one of the things that I... <laughs> What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. One of the things that's delayed the issuance of this permit is MDE tr is trying to get their trade marketplace set up for nutrient trading between the different permitted entities. So, you know, what that ends up looking like, we don't know yet. That's There's so many unknowns built into this, including, you know, how much credits will be if we are able to purchase them from potentially agricultural areas. So... You know, yes, the answer is yes, potentially we could sell them to Montgomery County, but more likely we would want to bank them for ourselves and hold on to them for the next permit cycle. It's unlikely, even though going back to 2006, I think we've done a pretty good study to say we will not exceed our requirement. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't be moving forward with some of the projects we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so could we build some stormwater management projects on the Panhandle where it's cheaper and you know, use those credits? It, for in us? theory, under the potentially, it depends on what the I'm state's program that. actually is because you know the, 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 the pollutants and nutrients rioting. aren't the same across watersheds. Right. So we don't we don't know what it's going to look like, but yeah. That's one of those post 10 p.m. suggestions. <laughs> well, they're looking at our solar field out there too. Put it on top of them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Do you do you have any more? Uh, I don't know. Real yeah, questions. Okay. okay. <laughs> Is there anybody, um, any other staff that's expecting to present to us? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. I doubt if you'll get any takers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, then I will. Uh, again, thank everybody and congratulate everybody uh, for doing such a really good job. And um, uh, note that we have no work session on uh, Monday, April 30th. The next regular session of the Mayor Council is Monday, May 7th, 7.30 p.m. right here. Um, 
if I don't know if there's any registration, if there's room left at State of the City, but we do have our St State of the City event coming up on Thursday. And if you're interested, contact, I guess, uh, Britta, your office, the Public Information Office, um, and um, RSVP and show up, and we'll be glad to see you on Thursday. And again, uh, save the date for the book festival and for uh, La Mia de Mayo. Um, all of this is coming up to busy time. Um, until next time, let's do great things. Gaithersburg, we are adjourned.